Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the very beginning of your sunset safari. But right now the sun is extremely high in the sky and it is a sweltering hot day here in Juma Private Game Reserve. Whew! These impalas are doing exactly what the people in the vehicle are doing and that is seeking some shade, some relief from that sun. We always complain about the weather, it is what we do here at Safari Live. But good afternoon, my name is Lauren and I do have Olaf on camera and we are going to start with the usual suspects and they are the Impala. If we didn't have the Impala we would be very very sad. But this safari is not only live, it's also interactive. And that means you guys can talk to us. And please do. If you're watching on the app or the website, you must register. And as long as you've done that, you can ask us questions, send in your comments. A joke or two is always appreciated. <laughs> and of course, any topics that you want to discuss. However, if you're watching on YouTube, do make sure you click that bell and subscribe so that Wild Earth can notify you of all the awesome content that we do have. And it's not just me out in Juma. We have Steve and Darby on the other vehicle, which we've named Rusty. Don't ask any questions. But we also have Chris and Panda out in Pridelands, not too far away from where we are. Down in the Eastern Cape, we have Tess and Morgan in Karicha. Also in the Eastern Cape, we have the beautiful Trishala and Alex will be manning the water hose. Oh, that breeze is nice. Keep coming, breeze, keep coming. Xavier, I'm glad you're with us. You're excited to see what today has to offer. Me too. I found my flower crab spider this morning, so I was overjoyed. And Candace actually gave me that challenge. So you're welcome to also give us challenges. No, we're not going to find an aardvark or a pangolin. But if you want to see a specific insect, a specific bird or mammal, please send it in. Give us that challenge and we will try to find it for you. I emphasize the word try there because we will do our best. It's been a quiet few days after our leopard palooza the other night where we had seven leopards in the whole day. It's gotten a bit quiet but that's very normal for the bush. It's like a roller coaster and you just gotta ride it. I would like some hyena action today. I'm just going to put that out there. Been very lucky with lions, very lucky with leopards. Insects, oh, they're just everywhere. Hyenas, I'm lacking a bit. So that is my bucket list. But I think Olaf and I are going to enjoy the shade a little bit longer. But let's take a look at the weather. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to what is indeed a very warm Juma Private Game Reserve. My name is Steve. I'm joined by Davisita on camera, and we are out and about. And we're thinking this afternoon we're going to focus on a little bit of ecology. Ecology? Now, many of you might think, oh my word, Steve. Ecology. Now, ecology is a very, very broad term. What does ecology mean? It is the study of an organism and its ability to survive in its environment, so dealing with its living and non-living components. Okay, non-living, weather, which includes rainfall, temperature. Oh, we have we have uh, another vehicle over there. We will we'll go this way then. So ecology is an organism's ability to survive in its landscape, in its environment, with regards to the weather, with regards to the climate, with regards to the temperature. Those are all the non-living. So cold, hot. And then, how does it survive with the living component? How does it get food? How does it breed? How does it interact with other animals? How does it compete for survival? Okay, it sounds very, very broad. 
But ecology is a fascinating topic, and I think, as a guide, if a guide knows ecology, animal behavior, birding, and some tracking, golden. You're golden in this industry. Obviously, the birding takes time, and that comes with the, with the way things go, but you understand ecology, and you understand animal behavior, it's amazing how much you can actually figure out out here, just by detailing, you know. I mean, humans have, have overcome a lot of the ecological issues that we have. You know, I could never walk as far as this vehicle can take me. I could never keep food as long as I do because of a fridge. I live in a, in a home that's got a fan and running water. So lots of things that we've used or have designed to make our life a lot easier. Kerry Ann, I had a wonderful biology teacher that taught me lots and I fell in love with ecology all the way back then. So it's an important thing and it, it scares people when you say the word ecology. They think, oh my word, there's so much to talk about. There is, there is so much to talk about. How does a grass interact with the tree in the environment? How do they grow their leaves? How do the roots go down? The difference between grass roots and tree roots for the access to water and the nutrients. The leaves are there for photosynthesizing. Um, seasonal rainfall. So the ecology of those organisms is, is pretty simple. It's not very difficult. Some of them design themselves to be unpalatable. Some of them are very tasty. Some want to be eaten and some don't. The distribution of the seeds is generally carried out by some organism. It could be ants. It could be birds. Pollination with grasses are generally with the wind. So pretty straightforward. But when you look at a flower, just think of the ecological adaptations that that plant has gone through to enable that organism to survive, to reproduce, to spread its seed and to make the seed move on, to gather the energy from the sun, to survive in a harsh environment or a cold environment. So many things. So that will be the thing for today, ecology. And obviously, talk about ecology, habitats are included in ecology and how animals live in those habitats, ecosystems, biomes, weather and climate. There is a predicted cyclone off of the coast of Mozambique, which we saw a front pulling in today, but it seems to have sort of abated, but we're not sure. We're not sure what's happening. It's just gotten very, very hot. So because of the heat and because of the summer sun, most of our animals will be hiding out in the shade and some of them will be going to go and have a drink at some point. So we'll check some water points. Uh, we might start with Gallego Pan, just because why not? And Tlalamba did come into our camp last night over there. Who knows where she's gotten to? Why would you ecology? We'll see if we can pick her up as well. We are heading to a waterhole ourselves. We are about T minus 40 seconds out. I'm just gonna put my sunglasses on because today is so bright white I can barely see. And let's see if we can get to this water hole. Really, today is so hot that that's when I want to see big groups of elephants, big herds all around the water holes. All the other animals coming down to drink But apparently we are in store for rain. There's a stone coming. Whether it hits the way it's supposed to hit, well, that's another question. But if it does hit, then we're going to be complaining about the rain in a few days. So let's not complain about the sun right now. But weather is very much part of your experience out here, part of your bumble. Almost here. Is anybody here? Hmm. A 
looks rather quiet, but let's see if we can make it onto the dam wall and give you a view. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Okay, Olaf, work your magic. Quiet, but sparkly and beautiful and delicious looking dam. I wish I could just jump in. Not even a hippo. It's been abandoned, this dam. Hot, hot, hot afternoon. Very, very hot, very humid here at Pridelands. And we have made our way to one of the water holes. It's called Leopard Dam. And talking about leopard, uh, I just went to the site where the big Sipan female had that kudu carcass this morning up in a tree. There is no visual of any predator there. Uh, the carcass is still around, however, it's not up in the tree, it's down on the ground under a bush. She's so obviously fed on it during the day. So we will return there a little bit later, possibly. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, safari vehicles every now and then checking out. So if there's nothing happening, we probably won't return. But we will, we will keep regular updates or receive regular updates about what's happening there. Anyway, my name is Chris Erasmus and with me on Camops is Panda Glitz. And we are at Leopard Dam, the dam in the northwest portion of Pridelands Conservancy. Very full at the moment. And I have heard some elephants not too far from us. And I'm going to wait here in the hope that they'll come and drink. And while we wait for these elephants to appear, let's go over to Steve at Juma, who's doing some birding. Well, welcome back. We've got one of the largest birds of prey that we find in this area. Looks like it's had a meal. The one and only Marshall Eagle. This is an adult. And you would regard them as an apex predator. So yes, it also falls into ecology. The trophic levels. The predators all the way down to the decomposers. So apex predators are right up at the top. And they feed on prey animals. And the Marshall Eagle feeds on a wide variety of small mammals, up to the, as large as a steenbok, jackal, hares. We actually saw one the other day with a hare, just after drive. Many, many different types of bird species and reptiles. So they've adapted ecologically those talons, as most raptors have to catch their prey, to sever the cervical vertebrae of prey and to hold it while they rip it apart with their predatory beak, which is designed for that purpose. They are powerful enough to pick their prey up and actually fly off to a perch where they will be able to feed. But large birds of prey are a very good indication of a healthy ecosystem. There needs to be balance. And if your large birds of prey are missing, something is untoward. Cameron, I'm not sure how what the heaviest prey is that they can carry, but I've seen them with impala, I've seen them with sharp schreisbok, with steenbok. They were on the floor with it. They didn't carry it away. So I don't know. I've seen them flying away with a pretty decent sized monitor lizard. But probably in the region of about 8 kilograms. The bird themselves only weighs 4 kilograms. So can you imagine being able to pick up twice your body weight to fly off?
their habitat preference is a nice open savanna and woodlands. Also semi-arid shrublands. They do generally keep away from mountainous areas. And their diet varies depending on where they are in the country. They've got quite a wide range across the country depending on the, the prey availability, their prey selection percentage-wise percentage -wise changes. Perched in a nice dead tree. Seemingly our large birds of prey seem immune to the heat. Their feathers act not only as insulation in the cold, they also protect them in the sunshine. Picky, your favourite, this is one of the coolest birds around, isn't it? The Marshall Eagle. And generally when you see a Marshall Eagle in these areas, it's probably the same one. And this is an adult, and we've seen it five or six times now since I've been here. Um, they do have quite a large range. But the feathers that keep them insulated, keep them warm, will also keep most of the sun off of them. But large birds of prey, not uncommon to see them standing in bodies of water, cooling off their feet. And if they are very hot, like right now, you'll see them with their beak open, allowing the wind to pass over the tongue to assist in cooling that way. They are mono monogamous birds and they prefer tall trees where they build their platforms. Take me outside the wing is 580 to 669. So 607 is the average. I'm guessing that's centimeters. Females slightly bigger, average of 647. Briakop ardent in Afrikaans. So most of our small birds of prey, oh, birds of game birds, small mammals, absolutely lose their mind when they see this bird. That is the issue, they don't always see it. They come in from quite a long distance. Don't know how they record it, but they suggest that they potentially spot prey from up, from up to six kilometers away, soaring in coming to catch it. I can imagine seeing your food from six kilometers. I don't know how that's possible. Okay, well they are known to hunt around watering holes and physically grabbing herons out of their nests. But uh, we don't have any herons breeding around here, but Lauren is at a watering hole. Let's go see if she's got any birds there. I've been looking for that Marshall Eagle. Well done, Steve. If it's a juvenile one, it's been hanging around a fair bit. Now, we've come to an area that I haven't been to since coming back. This is a quarry. It's right on our southern boundary and is actually an area where 
a sort of young pair of cubs, boy and girl, used to hang out all the time. Leopard cubs, sorry. And it's just a secret little spot off the beaten track and naturally it's filled up with water. This would be a perfect place to come and check for leopards. It's not one of the main water bodies that get crowded. It's just a secret little spot. And it's so beautiful and so full. It was Hosanna and Shongile. The leopards used to come here. Her dragonflies dancing, vegetation flourishing. It's a really nice little spot. But in winter, you'll see nothing here. It'll be completely barren. There won't be a drop of water. But as I was driving past, I thought about Hosanna and Shongili, and I thought I should just go and check and see what it looks like, and it looks stunning. Moonbeam Smith, you would like to see small cats. Oh, interesting. So you don't want to see the big cats. You don't want to see any of the panthera genus. You want to see the small cats. Alrighty, we can definitely try. That's more a nocturnal mission. But of course we do get, well, we supposedly get caracal here never seen one here. I believe Taylor has. You do get them in Amakala, Serval, African Wildcat, Janet, they're all semi-possible. So okay, for you, we shall try. Alrighty, let us keep bumbling. I would also like to see those. Vicky, that's what I'm hoping for. That's what I came to the secret spot for. I'm hoping for elephants and a pool party and splishing and splashing and all sorts of stuff where we can sit in the shade and just watch. But sadly, no one was at my little secret spot. But really, when you are looking for, for cats, you don't want to, you're not going to find the cats around Chitwa Dam, really. I mean, you can, but you want to go for those pans that you know of that are in the block. You want to follow those animal pathways. You want to go into drainage lines. Of course, yes, we've had many leopards around Chitwa Dam, but when you really are looking for the big cats, not the small cats, you want to just take those, you want to go off the beaten track, basically. There are all sorts of little hidden areas and pans and cool patches of shade that they are absolutely going to enjoy on a day like this. Moonbeam Smith, that's a good one because I do feel the small cats get ignored sometime. Laura, okay, that's possible, a dwarf mongoose. That is very possible. I had a very interesting sighting this morning with dwarf mongoose. Okay. If we see them, we shall stop. I actually saw Band-Aid yesterday, which was lovely, but uh, they're just not easy to put on camera, even in Medikwe. <laughs> hyena boy, okay, whoa, whoa, hyena boy, you have a big list, okay. You want hyenas, naturally, your name is hyena boy. You want wild dogs and you want jackal. Righty ho. That is a big ask, <laughs> but we shall try. I'm sure that Amakala or Madikwe can win on the jackal front. Juma's not an amazing place to see jackal. You can see them, but it's not something that you see regularly. Wild dogs, oof. I haven't had a wild dog, have I? No, I haven't. I haven't had a wild dog sighting this stint. Okay, hyena boy, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna target your first option, hyenas. I'm gonna go for dwarf mongoose and an elephant pool party. At 
Wild Earth, we are dedicated to bringing kids into the wild on our live, free, interactive safaris. Many of you will remember that we used to do this on a daily basis prior to the pandemic. But now, courtesy of our Wild Earth explorers, we're aiming to take schools back into nature permanently. We'd like to extend an extremely heartfelt thanks to our Wild Earth explorers who have helped us touch the lives of so many children. Well, yesterday, everybody, if you joined us on the Sunset Safari, I delved into some vegetation, sort of vegetation types, looking at a few trees, and then uh, spoke about the sort of three sort of major vegetation units that we find here in Juma. And where we find ourselves now, I'm going to turn around here. This is just a little two track we used to have into the den site at one point. Anyway, maybe I'll just go to the end, poke our nose into the drainage. We're basically between two little river systems here um, on the western side of Galagopan and uh, they're drainage systems that feed into the, the, the Mil Milwati. Um, they're not permanent fixtures but they are made up of lots and lots of guari bushes along the edges. Down in there is a ravine. Getting in there is, is quite tricky with the vehicle, but on foot it's a wonderful place. This is a place that we've spent a lot of time uh, tracking Tandi in the day and Tlalamba. We used to do our bush walks. And down there, there's some tall trees, some jackalberries, some tambuertis. And these drainage systems and depressions that have thickets along the edges, they've got deep soil, they've got long grass, they've got thick bush vegetation. It's quite a dense vegetation unit. So the habitat is ideal for our nicely camouflaged nyala, bushbuck, and daika will move through them, transitioning into sort of more open areas as well. Impala rarely hang out in there, but will move through. But it is the ideal habitat for leopard and lion breeding. Leopards specifically for, for their, their livelihood because they are hunting those small animals I spoke about before. Um, but denning in and around here, there's lots of little hidey holes that are instrumental for the breeding site for lion and leopard. And without those breeding sites, the habitat that those cats are looking for doesn't exist. It's one of the reasons why Juma has got such a high density of leopard and why 
all the properties around here all come charging down into Juma to see our leopards because we've got such ideal habitat for them. Habitat is the cover, it's the shelter, it's the food, it's the place to breed. Okay, so we need tall trees for hoisting and we need den sites. Without the den sites, they won't breed here, they won't hang out here for very long. Without the tall trees for hoisting, they don't have anywhere to put their food. Um, lions will come in and out of here because they also feed on kudu and nyala and the like and they need these areas for denning as well. So there's a question from someone about how are we going to deal with the long grass. No, there's nothing we can do. The grass is, we're going to get the, the buffalo lawnmower, um, what's the word, garden service in soon and they're going to come mowing the lawn. I don't know where the buffalo are, I think they're enjoying the the sweet vegetation in the Manuleti. Um, they'll be through at some point and they will mow the lawn. Elephants will mow some of it as well. Some of the rhinos will do a good job but there's nothing we can do about it. We're just going to have to try and find animals in the thickets. That's why we're moving into topics of habitats and, um, and ecology. So this, this is a depression running on the left running on the right and you can see how dense it is on either side you know without really delving into it you could get quite lost in here and you could easily bump um, a dugger boy you could easily bump a sleeping cat and you could easily bump a herd of elephants who also like to move through these thicket like areas so this is the low-lying area it's all trees thickets dense vegetation lots of nutrients and lots of hidey holes. Even a hippo moving through there. So a tricky area to come because if we do find Tlalamba or Tandi in these areas, it's almost in the day, it's almost impossible to see them, but they love to hang out. It's a perfect spot to secret away a little cub or two. Okay, we're gonna carry, carry on over here, keep delving into our topic and send you up to Lauren who I think is doing a spotted birding. We were driving past this area and we can't just drive past. We must stop. We must check it out. Just listen, how could you just drive past this? Because soon it'll be gone. When winter comes, this will all be over. So let's enjoy it for a moment or two. Joe, you're asking how long do they nest for? And these are the village weavers. And basically they come here to breed. 
They arrive with summer, plenty of food, if you think about it. Nothing is in short supply right now, not water, not insects, nothing. And insects is what they love. They will also eat seeds and drink nectar, but really insects are what they're after, which gives them plenty of energy to build these nests. And it's hard work if you think about it. It's not easy doing this and it lasts the entire breeding season. They are sort of um, polygynous, so they will mate with many, many different females and try to mate with as many different females as possible because that means you're secure in your paternity right across the board. The more chicks you have, the better for you, the better for your bloodline. So this takes up the entire breeding season. And the incubation period itself is only around 12 days. So it's really not long that the female sits in there with the eggs. She's the only incubator. The male then sort of goes off. There's no paternal care. There's paternal investment by building the nest. But after that, he has no part in raising the chicks. So she will incubate for, on average, 12 days, um, which is really, really quick. And before you know it, the chicks will be ready to fledge. And it's just building nests every day. Some work, some don't. When you get one that works and a female chooses it, you've got to start again. Go on to the next one. The more nests, the more females, the more offspring. Speed dating of the bush. Darcy, me too. And I think it's really important to, to spend time with the summer sightings, I like to call them, because honestly, I've worked here for four years and I know what it's like when winter comes around. Winter brings us benefits, but all of a sudden the bush goes very quiet. It loses its, rich in, its richness and vibrance in terms of color and it just completely transforms. And you miss this. You drive past areas like this thinking, oh, I wish I could hear the weavers. I wish it was still green. I wish the insects were constantly flying into my face. You miss it. So it's always important to spend time in these sightings. Oh, isn't this just so incredible? Well, as we sit here, we're going to send you guys over to Chris. Right. And you can see what I mentioned about hot day. It is very hot. Two things happening here. All right. We in shade, because we have to, the sun is blistering. And the elephants are in the shade. You see how they're just sitting there, flapping the ears to cool themselves down. And it looks like there might be a cloud bank on the west, east actually approaching us as well. Quite a stiff cloud bank. And I, I think it's probably just forerunners of that tropical storm or you know, the outer bands of it, uh, you know, it's bound to happen. That probably will not bring rain. We're still uncertain as to what path this thing will take. We don't know. We don't know yet. For now, it looks good. So it's just very hot at the moment. So that even the elephants are hiding from the sun. <coughs> I 
<clears throat> and we have a question from Ruth asking how far are they from the dam. Uh, in a straight line, Ruth, we probably about, I would say, two kilometers or a kilometer and a half, somewhere in that sort of range. Um, I suspect that they they will eventually end up there. Although I can see some of them who do have fresh mud on them, but doesn't mean they've been to the dam. It might have been just in a wallow somewhere that they found a bit of mud. And some of them are in the open, already starting to eat. And there's just so much food for them at the moment. So much food. find fascinating how some of them are okay with the sun and some are obviously feeling very hot but this is a quite a big herd they spread out all over the place i mean i can see some on the other side there behind us there's elephants there's some to our left some to our front uh, quite widespread quite a nice sized herd of ellies Love watching Ellie's. So there's quite a lot of grass here, man. And this little patch is right on the edge of a drainage line or a small seasonal river. Stream, rather. They call it a drainage line. And the grass that dominates along the bank here is guinea grass, which is highly nutritious. And see how tall those grasses are compared to those elephants. And that is just elephant food. Oh, there was two young ones just having a bit of a sparring session there. So what I love about elephants. You can move from elephant to elephant and each and every one is doing something different. Some are eating, some are playing, some are sleeping. That one to our left now found, uh, and, and now you can see why we really do not want to go off road. I mean, there's sludge and mud there, you'll get stuck. Oh, welcome back, everybody. We find ourselves in the lowest part of the property, one of the lowest parts, anyway, where. The rain over eons has carved out these streams and even exposed the parent rock underneath. So this is granite that I'm sitting on. So majority of the of the soil that we talk about in these areas derived from granitic soils or if not granitic soils from sandstone from the mountains all the way to the west. And rivers are such a wonderful thing because they carve through the landscape and in areas where they've carved down you can actually see what the parent rock is underneath. The soil itself has come from somewhere. It's very sandy soil. You can see it's quite coarse grained. We've got some of it over here. Coarse grained, so it's very large particles. But can you see in the water here, Darby, there's some really, lots of black. You see there's some black stuff over here. I'll see if I can get it out. It's difficult to actually get out, but the black stuff is nutrients. It's organic material and it's possibly even clay. There's some of it on the surface over here. You 
can actually see the difference between them there. And the clays and the nutrients are much smaller particles, uh, much finer versus the coarse grained over here. These sediments, you can actually see them. You can actually count them if you wanted to. Whereas this sediment over here, if you had to try and count it and differentiate it, it's very, very difficult to do. So it's very fine grained. And that's what gets washed down to the bottom of the landscape. And the smaller the particles, the further down they get washed. Whereas the larger particles will stay further up the landscape. So that's where we get our nutrients, all the way down on the bottom. And they also get washed out all the way to the ocean uh, eventually. But uh, that's why when we talk about the catena, we talk about the top of the slope, the rain coming down, washing the nutrients and the salts down. And they end up at the bottom of the landscape. They even get washed down. And the rivers... This is just a little stream, a little river stream that's quite often very, very dry. It's flowing. And that is because of the seep and because of the water that's fallen over the last few weeks. Cindy, do you want to know how earthworms are important to an ecosystem? Well, earthworms are so vitally important because they are essentially the farmers of the system. Now, everything around us here, including this water, including the soil, is, has got some form of oxygen in it. The plants, the soil here, has got some form of oxygen. And what earthworms do is they excavate in the soil and they aerate the soil. They keep oxygen coming in. We get two types of systems. We get aerobic, which has got oxygen. We get anaerobic. If you've ever been in a marsh or in a, a pan or somewhere where you dig your foot in, and you lift your foot out and you get that rotten egg smell, that is anaerobic, and that's generally a very, very different system from what most of we, of, of us organisms live in, aerobic. So earthworms aerate the soil, and they enable bacteria and microorganisms to proliferate in the soil, which break down nutrients, recycling the nutrients back into the soil, back into usable nitrates and nitrites, which are then used once again by plants, like all of these around us, for perpetuating the other species that will feed on them. So the organic material gets recycled into the soil. The earthworms, some people say the earthworms aren't even the ones that eat that food. They eat the bacteria that surrounds that organic material and then defecate out organic material that is rich in microorganisms, rich in nutrients, and rich in so many, many things. I did a thesis on earthworms, so I could talk to you for days about it, but we won't bore you with that now. We'll send you over to Lauren, who I think is just down the road, enjoying herself at another watching hole. Well, Vicky, it's not quite a pool party, but it's elephants, and we are at a dam. So I'm only hoping they get their water walk on and they all start coming down. But for some reason, <laughs> it looks like they're heading in the opposite direction. I don't know why they would not come down to the, this dam. But let's see, let's keep waiting. And I know it's not a pool party, Vicky, but can we take it off the list? Oh, have you already had a drink? You have. That's why your trunk is wet. Hmm. That's why you're not in an immediate rush. And I said Janet under small cats earlier. Sorry, my bad. They aren't actually cats. They're not really members of Felidae. But a lot of people call them Janet cat or civet cats. And... They're the small cats that are not really cats. <laughs> they belong to Viveridae and not Felidae. But still, we'll put cat at the end, Jenny Cat, Civet Cat. And you know, water is everywhere. They could have even been in the Mulwati, which is still flowing. <laughs> eagle lover wouldn't we all wouldn't we all love to see a young elephant with a lot of attitude there's a youngster heading right towards our rain roof pole which we're using for shade today shade from the sun not the rain I would like to see that too elephant calves they just make me laugh 
They're trying so hard to be adult. They're trying so hard to be big and scary and they're just not. If they really don't look like they're coming towards the water, we will loop around and try and catch up with the herd. There's a bit in the Mowati, which is a river called Spaghetti Crossing. And it's really not that interesting, except that's where you cross the river to get onto various different roads. And Ravi and I tried to cross it last night and we thought, mm, this does not look very safe. And we abandoned our mission. And Steve came back from drive this morning and said, guys, do you think we can cross Spaghetti Crossing? I'm so ready to do it, but I'm also scared. I don't want to get stuck. <laughs> so that's how we feel right now. But I would really like to head that way. <laughs> but I do not want to be the one vehicle that gets stuck. It's still flowing quite a lot and it's soft sand underneath, not hard substrate. Who do you think is going to be braver to do it first, Steve or myself? We have a joke here. Alora, what does an elephant wear to a pool party? Oh, I knew it. I knew it. They wear their swimming trunks. Ha ha ha. Nice dad joke you got there. They do wear their swimming trunks. <laughs> And now I'm actually imagining an elephant in trunks. Literally trunks. Thank you, Alora. But talking of pool parties, I just don't think it's going to happen. They've already had water, I guess. They're already cool enough. There are some up ahead, actually. I think if we just go to the end of the dam here, Olaf, we're going to catch up with some of them. <laughs> if we ever make it there. If Wendy lets me. Okay, third time lucky. Ah, see? This is a sassy, sassy girl. We don't need a sassy elephant. I'm just going to put my sunglasses on because we're staring into the sun. There you are. Why are you not coming to the water? We've been waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Have you got your swimming trunks on? I'm nicely tucked into the shade there. Elephants can withstand a lot of sun. They are equipped to do so. But still, when there's shade, ugh, everyone's going to go in it. Nan, I'm beginning to think that myself. We should rename Wendy as third time lucky. She's just such a fantastic car to drive, really. These short based Land Rovers, I, I just love them. They're really robust. Yes, they have their failures, but 
I love driving Wendy. But right now she's just having a little bit of a moment. But our legend that is Opa will sort her out. Do not worry. Wild Earth would not be here if it wasn't for Opa. <laughs> Aren't you just the sweetest thing? And just a reminder, everyone, before I really do forget, both Steve and I will be doing an AMA together. Yes, can you believe it? Most of the naturalists have done AMAs, but not necessarily together. So we, of course, want you guys to join us on that one. And that will be tomorrow in the evening after drive at eight o'clock central african time both steve and i are going to answer well any of your questions to be honest it is for explorers only but please do have your questions ready and it can be anything within reason i loved my last one i got asked many interesting questions including are you a natural blonde hmm I've got rid of my blonde, everyone. Definitely not natural. But thank you for asking. <laughs> so we really do hope to see you guys there. Oh, we've got an itchy eye. Does this classify as a sassy youngster for you, eagle lover? Not quite sassy, but adorable. Good afternoon, everybody. It seems like it's been a very eventful sunset safari so far. This is a beautiful landscape in Amakala Game Reserve down in the Eastern Cape, and we are experiencing some very strange 
weather. Now, I know there are storms coming in everywhere, but we have literally had four seasons in a day today, and we've had quite a successful day so far. My name is Tess. I'll be taking you out on your adventure here in the Eastern Cape for the afternoon. Behind the camera is Morgan. We are having a fantastic time. This morning, we started off with rain and mist. We could hardly see any of these mountains that you can see at the moment. Then it changed to intense heat and like you cannot believe while sitting with a beautiful male lion down in the basin and then it changed to cloud cover and rain again <laughs> so we've had rain on and off for the first hour and a bit of our sunset safari but we are up in the western corner of Amakala looking out over the rest of it which is a beautiful green view and looking for the three male cheetahs very unsuccessfully so far but hopefully that changes. <laughs> now, of course, we do know that there is some intense weather coming this way in the coming days. It is supposed to be further north, but let me tell you, the south has been crazy today. <laughs> Susan, Amakala has the most lookout spots of any other reserve I've ever been to in my life. It is crazy how many lookouts there are. If you can look at the view in front of you, and try and count just the crests between us and the horizon. I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Easily eight crests between us and the horizon. And that's me being a low counter. There are many in between. Every crest probably has at least 10 viewpoints where you can stop. And they're not official viewpoints where there's a little bench to sit or a path off the road. These are just spots where as you come over the crest or around the corner on a road, there is an exceptionally beautiful view in front of you. So there are hundreds of viewpoints on Amakala. Because we are literally surrounded by crests and valleys, every time you go onto a crest, you are guaranteed of at least 10 views, I'd say. And they're all spectacular. But even down in the valleys, there are some beautiful areas, nice and thick. Then you go up to the dune forests, you're in these thickets, but the view is amazing. Even from the dune forest, you can look down over the rest of the dune forest in some spots. It's just exceptional. It's one thing that you physically cannot get bored of any view at Amakala. Because everywhere you look, there's something you notice that you haven't noticed before. But it's also one of the main ways that we spot animals here, which is why you see us doing it quite a lot. Not just to appreciate the scenery and the landscape, which in itself is more than enough reason to be out here. But because there are so many crests and valleys with so many thickets, that sometimes this is the best way for us to find the cheetahs or any other animals that might be down in the other side or in the valleys hiding in thickets. Mishka, it is freezing here. This morning we started off uh, not really knowing what to expect for the day and then it got blisteringly hot and now it is freezing cold again and of course it's the one day that Morgan forgot to bring a jacket. So he might have to try and fit into one of mine. <laughs> he doesn't like that idea. <laughs> but yes, it is very cold here and we're expecting it to get a lot colder. We weren't supposed to have any rain today, there was absolutely none predicted. So this was a surprise to us. We woke up this morning after a hot day yesterday and it was like we'd woken up in a completely different place on the map. But this is affecting the animals. So we've been hearing the other guides on the radio all afternoon saying they're looking for elephants, they're looking for buffaloes, they're looking for all sorts of things. And all the animals are expecting the change in weather. There is severe weather coming. So the elephants have disappeared up the valleys, the lions have gone into hiding. The only thing so far has been buffaloes. And that's, I think, because they're a little bit more hardy than other animals. But hopefully the cheetahs decide to come out. I think they're in this valley in front of us, so we're going to keep scanning for a bit and hope that they come out and surprise us. But for now, we'll send you back over to Steve, who is still next to the little stream. Thanks, Tess. Well, Amakala might have some lovely views, but Juma right now has got some lovely shady spots down here in the drainage line. And what I've got, I've just scraped a little bit of mud off the side of the bank where the water's not flowing too heavily. 
And you'll see the difference between what I showed you before, the coarse sandy soils, which has got minerals in there, it's quite easy to see, got quartz crystals and the like, you could actually probably count them, but in here, it's very sludgy, almost impossible to differentiate the plant particles, and the plants, the soil particles. So very clay-like soil, very sandy soil, very consistent. So this would be very well drained, this would be good at water holding, and also good at nutrient holding. So clay soils down at the bottom of the landscape will end up in the lakes, will end up in the dams, and will also hold the water in there. That's why we get seasonal pans down in the low-lying areas, and with the clays rushing down, we've also got all of this organic material, as I said before. Not just the small particles, but the decent-sized particles will all get washed down, the streams, the rain cleanses the landscape, almost like the city, how the rain cleanses the streets. Everything goes through the gutters down into the stormwater drains. But in this way, this is the arterial life of our systems. And the organic material ending up in the dams, in the lakes, in the water holes, they then get fed upon by microorganisms, which then get fed upon by small insects, which then get fed upon by fish, which then get fed upon by crocodiles, and then a smorgasbord of medium to large sized birds. So without the water bringing the organic material down, we wouldn't have all of that life further downstream. So ecology is just playing itself out. And where we sit here in this landscape, you can imagine that eons ago, before there was any vegetation, before there was grass, before there was trees, this rock I was sitting on was exposed by the rainfall washing sediment to and from. You know, we were probably underneath a huge ocean at one point, and as the ocean dropped, so small parts of the landscape drained faster than others and that led to to riverine areas like this without trees without vegetation so the landscape was shaped a long time ago and that created all these different habitats the soil depth um, nutrients open areas elevated areas and then the first plants came along and started moving into these areas and then habitats themselves started forming probably long before many sort of mammalian bird life was even on record of even being anywhere near existence Beautiful. What now is a very, very 2023 landscape that's been like this probably for a few thousand years easily, easily changed slightly because we're in the savanna biome. So the dynamics of this has changed due to fire, due to elephant damage, due to droughts. But other than that, it hasn't changed a lot. It's moved from one to the other just very slightly. But in this little area over here, all the little nooks and crannies we talked about before with regards to leopard and lion breeding. We've had Tingana in a tree just over here at one point. The amount of birds that will live in this habitat, the amount of insects, so many different life forms living down here. It's nice and cool, it's nice and shady. And uh, if you do do a spot of birding and you are looking at different habitat types, this would be one of the habitat types that you'd be looking for, riparian vegetation. So that is the vegetation running along our river systems. and. As you can clearly see, it is indeed a river system. And it's, it's drinkable, actually. The landscape is quite clean at the moment. It's been well flushed, and there's not too many pollutants upstream of these little seeps. All of these streams would have been coming straight out of the landscape, down through the soil, and into the river. JD, why does it look scary? I can see the bottom of the water. There's no crocodiles in here. I have been meditating on this rock, waiting for you to join us again and just getting in touch with nature. There's so much connection with finding yourself on a rock that is probably two, two and a half billion years old. Can you imagine? This rock came up as molten rock in the Earth's crust, came up, didn't erupt onto the Earth's surface and stayed underneath uh, as magma, uh, quartz, sorry, so granite. And uh, then the Earth's rainfall changed the landscape and moved. This is all before vegetation, moved it all down and then carved out these little furrows and to expose rocks like this. And the Sabi Sands, in this area here, we don't see too many exposed geological formations. But further south, further north, there's plenty of them. And that is eons ago of time. Now we're seeing a rock that's two and a half billion years old. Can you even comprehend the history and the life? And it's very, very hard. But if we look closely at this rock, over here, 
there's actually ecology happening on the rock itself. The soil I spoke about before, the clay, the sand, is non-living. The rock itself is non-living, but on the rock here, we've got little yellow or orangey bits, some darker bits. This is lichen, whereby we've got algae and fungi, two symbiotic symbonts, an algae and a fungus of different species that are coexisting on this rock and breaking down minerals of the rock itself, living off of nutrients that they are deriving from the rock. The, the fungus helps with the reproduction, the algae does the photosynthesis, and so they use minerals of the rock and take atmospheric moisture. It's just remarkable, two species living together, coexisting, feeding off of a rock for a very, very, very long time. And there's nothing to complain about, no, no, um, no news bulletins, no, no tax, no, no school runs with the kids, no pets to feed, just sitting there competing with themselves for space on the rock. That's about as much. Mara, it is beautiful here. <sighs> the, surrounded by the lungs of the bush, the trees are pushing out oxygen. The grasses around me are photosynthesized and taking in the CO2, pushing out oxygen. And it's just, it's clean down here. It's cool down here. It's a really nice place to hang out. And if you're an animal, a leopard or a lion or an elephant, where would you hang out right now? Right up on the top, like the Marshall Eagle was, where it's hot and bothersome, or down here where it's relatively cool? I know where I'd be hanging out. So this is where we're going to be checking, but we're going to continue on on our ecology chat this afternoon because, well, we can go on for days. I could sit here and point out many, many things about ecology. We could just go on. But it's also nice to take a breath. Just breathing in. Davi, you want to take a deep breath with me? I'm sure you do. I invite all of you to just take a deep breath with me there as well. Wherever you find yourself. Grateful for nature, grateful for the wide open spaces and for these places we can come to in solitude, in silence, connection. Mm. Very, very blessed. All right. Well, there's some people in front of us. We're all looking for some lions in this area. There's no official policy. If it's dry, let's go. If it's dry, let's go. Let's, let's do it. I'm right behind you. You've got the cruiser. <laughs> that sounds good. Sounds like there might be opportunity for some lions. We're going to find out now. We're just going to quickly figure out how dry it is. Apparently, Morris and Reynard have located the lions just in here. And um, we are on top of a ridge. So I'm just going to let the other guys go in first, assess what it looks like, and then we'll... And then we'll see if there's a possibility to get in there. Just let them go. It looks, I think we are okay to go off here. Yeah? So we're right on top of a, and it should be fine. I'm just going to give Reynard some time to get into the sighting, and then we'll uh, we'll follow. There are apparently some animals there, but we'll first have to see if it's accessible or not. I only know that a little later if I will be able to get there. So Morris has tracked these lions on foot. Sounds like six of them, probably breakaways or perhaps some of them gartis. 
but they are a little bit further into the woods right on top of this ridge the rain might not be in our favor but we'll we'll take a look if it's possible at all to get there Hello everybody, and just when you come to me, the wind starts to pick up again. I'm so sorry. Uh, I came down to this valley, to the Karika River again, to try and get away from the wind, which was a bit crazy up on the top in the, in the open area. But now it seems to have picked up again. I hope that it's not too bad. And if you're unsure, it's me, Trishala, in Karika. And behind those fallen over logs appears to be our Finfoot friend from the other day. Was it yesterday? I think so. I know, fantastic image we've got here. I'm hoping it will swim out of its little harbor there. Then we could have a better look. It's getting dark pretty quickly here in Karika today. Earlier, well, I mean, pretty much the whole day it's been hot, but very humid. So now the clouds have rolled in and has kind of robbed us of any light this afternoon or, you know, sunshine this afternoon. And I think we might get some rain. A little later it's starting to cool down so when the humidity goes up then that just means that there's lots of water in the atmosphere just waiting to fall as rain once that temperature drops down and I can feel it getting cooler Now on a side note, this has now become a bit of a, a happy place for me because there's no one around. No one, no one even drives through this area very much because it's quite steep and rocky. So people would prefer to go around and use the open fields if they're going from one spot to another. So I feel quite, uh, there's quite a bit of solitude to be found in this spot except that yesterday that solitude was interrupted but by what can only be described as a rather creepy interaction with a wildebeest who was uh, popping around the bushes to have a look at me except only its face not its body and now when I came down here again I heard it it went <laughs> Like a horse, kind of an in between of a neigh and a and a disgruntled hmm. something like that. It sounded judgmental, and then I heard it walk off in the bushes. Perhaps this was also that wildebeest spot of solitude, and then I came and plonked myself here. Anyway, Gwen and I have now named him Wilfred. Hopefully, I'll get to introduce Wilfred to you. Oh, there we go. We can definitely see it's a fin foot now. Look at that bright orange foot. Yay! This is great. It was so hard in the light. I mean, it, it's always a challenge when there's water and sunshine to get a clear image of something. But we just saw that bright orange foot come out. Telling us that the ID that I suspected yesterday is in fact correct. I hope that might be a new one for many of you. It's a new one for me. The African Finfoot. Now obviously it lives here and this is its its little spot. So I hope you'll get to have a closer look of it look at it sometime soon. Anyway, let me send you back over to Pridelands, to Chris, and you know where I'll be, sitting right here waiting for my otter. Right.
Can you see something lying in the grass there? I can't. It looks like um, we might be able to see these lions down, but they are lying flat in the grass there. There's no visual. And I'm not sure how we're going to get a visual in that grass, but they are there. We just saw one of them moving, but it went down into the grass. So at the moment, it's impossible. You're not going to see them there. I'm going to have to figure out a way to see if I can't. And I, the only problem is where we came in, the types of grasses I'm happy with. There's a lot of natal red top, a lot of uh, herringbone grass, and those are all suggesting very well leached soils, rocky coarse soils, which is unlikely to get us stuck and waterlogged, so that would be well drained. But there where those lines are, one can see there's a lot of guinea grass, which often likes to grow in damp areas, and that could indicate a potential soft area, which are still could potentially be waterlogged. All right, so they're not moving. We, the only thing we can do here is either wait or move away and come back later. They might move out more into the open or they might move further into the bush, which will make them inaccessible to us. And Tony's got a comment there. I'm sure the lions will use the grass to their advantage. No, they will definitely. Um, in this case, it conceals them. It breaks the wind. So they don't have all this heavy wind on them. It's cool. And when they hunt, it can give them some form of hiding places as well. It does... If they can't see in front of them, that can actually become a handicap. If the grass is too tall, they'll also avoid it in terms of movement, not necessarily sleeping. Yeah, I don't know how we're going to get to see them. They, they are flat flat cats and I mean that's a meter and a half tall grass a flat line in there so I'll I'll need to take a moment or two to figure out what we're gonna try and do it's not really much maneuver space so I can't really drive there while we try and figure out a way let's head over to Steve to see what's happening on his side number of bird species will use these drainage systems. You get a sort of a tiered system as well, you know. In forests you get birds that inhabit the, the ground. You get birds inhabit a few meters up and then a few meters up and then all the way up to the canopy you get these different layers in the landscape and here you find that as well to a lesser degree that you find birds that inhabit the floor of many of our areas here and then you get those that move through the canopy different types of feeding strategies and you see that one on the right Darby just on the right of the road there we go there is a Natal spur fowl one of our very common ground nesting and ground birds it's a male and you can see the spur on the back of the foot indicates that it's a male. And what is the purpose of the spur? Ecologically, the spur is designed to help that bird compete for mates by fighting with other males. The coloration you saw, it was pretty cryptic. It enabled them to be quite camouflaged in these undergrowth 
areas that, well, camouflage as we know, is one of the easiest and most ancient predator avoidance strategies around. So it saves you a lot of energy. Because from an ecological point of view, how do we survive out here? We want to save energy. You can't just keep stuffing food in and running. You just can't do that. So animals need to try and conserve as much energy as they can through whatever strategies that they can. And camouflage and concealment is the oldest and most basic form of predator avoidance. It took time, of course, for them to develop those colors. But once the colors developed, you probably would have got two ground birds that were quite similar, quite plain, and one was just a little bit more mottled than the other. And the genetics of that one were more successful. And so that led to much more camouflaged birds. Okay, well, we're gonna try to get down here. There's a bit of a, an interesting section of the road. Just hold on. Now the trees themselves and the grasses, ecologically, serve such an important purpose with regards to protecting the soil. All that we talk about is take eons to be created, eons to be created, and because of bad management practices and bad agricultural practices, we're seeing tons, cubic tons of it being lost into the oceans around the world every single minute. Some call them old favorites. They've been crowned Wild Earth veterans. I did not think I would ever face my fears like this. We just call them Lauren and Steve. Join these seasoned safari guides for an evening of fun as they share the hot seat for the first time. Remember to have your questions ready as this is a chance for you to ask them anything you want. See you there. caterpillar climb an entire marula. That's unbelievable. Of course we've he's gone now. I've never seen anything like that. From this trunk here, we'll show you the tree, to right up to the top. Where are you going little guy? I mean you defied gravity very well there. I can no longer see him. But that entire trunk. I'm looking for tree agamas.
for a certain someone. But no such luck. Oh, the two jackalberries where we always used to see them, I've just not seen them, which is a little bit sad. I think the caterpillar is gone. Looper caterpillars are everywhere right now. Everywhere, everywhere. Susan, yes, they do. All caterpillars do turn into butterflies. And it's a, it's a four-part life cycle that is just so fascinating because it starts with eggs, then it goes into a sort of pupil stage, which is the larval stage, which is the caterpillar. I'm actually scanning around to see if I can see any butterflies. But then it undergoes a metamorphosis. Oh, sorry, larvae, then the pupil stage in the chrysalis, which is what is, is like a cocoon, slightly different. And then it undergoes this amazing metamorphosis, as we know, into a butterfly. And it really is just the most incredible, incredible transformation when you think about it. And the main difference between a chrysalis and a cocoon is that a chrysalis is the hardened body of the butterfly pupil stage whereas a cocoon is the external structure that is made by the caterpillar itself so the cocoon is made and the chrysalis is actually part of what was the caterpillar but I think he's gone It was just such an adventurous caterpillar. I just wanted to show you all. Anyway, let's keep bumbling. Poor Olaf is just framing an empty marula. <laughs> ah, first time. Good girl. Okay, we're going to see what we can actually find for you all. And we're going to send you guys back over to Chris with these lions. Finally, we managed to get a view of them. And this is kind of like the only time that you will actually see them is when they stand up. Um, I'm going to move a bit forward to see. Just hold on. Don't go anywhere. And that problem with the tall grass is you cannot see logs and stuff. Like now. And they are on the move. I don't know if we'll be able to follow them for much further. Um, they are on the move We'll just get a last little view there. I'm, I'm reluctant to go further in Because I don't know what the conditions are. It gets quite rocky there. I think this is about as far as we can go. I think We might need to be satisfied with that quick view. I am uh, I'm not convinced that we should go after them. I know it gets very rocky here. Yeah? Lots of unknowns, wet soil, rocks. I'm gonna play it safe. What do you think, Panda? I think all of them have moved, eh? Can you see any of them? Uh, stations, these lines uh, have all moved deeper into the block in a northeastern direction. I'm unable to follow. I have lost visual. All right, so all we can do is to try and go around. I'm going to take a location pin here. And then we can go around to the other road, that side, perhaps we can get a view. So I can then use the pin and try and, you know, direction and kind of like gauge where they come out. So let's give that a shot. So 
So I'm just going to quickly put the location on here. And we have technology. Why not use it? And Ruth sends us a nice comment there. Hi there, Ruth. This is Catman Chris Strikes again. Thank you, Ruth. Well, in, the, in this case, I can't claim this one. It was found by another vehicle. But we're going to try and see if we can't get another sight of them. In the meantime, let's head over to Steve, who's made his way to a waterhole. Thanks, Chris. Well, we've caught up with a small group of waterbuck. And that gentleman at the back is doing what we were doing. He is keeping himself cool by spending time in the shade. It's what savannah animals do. That's why we have such a large portion or large number of different species in the savannah, because of the ability for them to use the shade to cool down. So from an ecological point of view, the shade enables many, many more animals to live here. In the desert it's a whole different story, the ecological adaptations that one has to go through to survive in an area that is so hot at day, in the daytime and so cold at night requires a lot more adaptation. So the water bucks that we can see as well, busy feeding. Now what do they feed on? They've got a pretty decent sized mouth, pretty decent sized body. So they can feed on lots of grass. The whole design of their, their mouth is to take in a decent portion of grass, similar to that of a zebra, although they don't chop it at the top like zebras do. They use only teeth on the bottom of the palate, or the bottom of the mouth, and the, the top is just a solid palate. So they rip the grass, and what's about prefer really high protein rich green grasses in a very close proximity to water. Important for them to keep cool because well they got such a shaggy coat. You often find them standing in the shade. The other individuals have done that as well. Enzo H10, well that takes me on to my next discussion point. Here we've got one in the frame with horns and there is one over there without horns. Now, when we look at animals that have horns and those that don't have horns, we need to say to ourselves, what is the purpose of the horns? And like the spur fowl we saw just now, the male has a spur on the foot, the back of the leg, to fight and compete for females. And while waterbuck males have horns to fight and compete for the mating rights for females. And it probably started off with very small um, uh, weapons, and over time, if you just look at the wide variety of antelope around the world and their horn structures and how diverse and dynamic they are, they have really developed into something quite dramatic. And the waterbuck has got some of the most impressive horns that you get. And those are for fighting with males. You see the tips are sharp all the way along and the ridges are or the, all along the horn they ridged which means when the horns lock they don't slip enabling the heavyweights of the waterbuck world when they compete to fight in a competition based on strength and if they do slip if the one turns away he loses his balance he can get impaled and injured and even killed so it's in his best interest to stand his ground and it's led to large horns perpetuating because the one with the biggest horns has the most ladies and so those genetics are passed on but for him to evade predation for him to evade those lions that Chris has got it's quite difficult waterbuck running through thick vegetation the horns are going to be in the way so the females which are a bit more woodland specialists that's where they take the youngsters they don't have the horns because it would be a disadvantage for them in evading predation so their strategy is to be more vigilant, uh, to hide their babies away, and if need be, run when they see predators. A 
and the tail of course everybody well from an ecological point of view what is the purpose of the tail the purpose of the tail is that um, none of these animals have got pants or underpants for that matter and there's lots of biting flies that love to land on the soft tissue around the anus and well they would lay eggs there if they could if not for a very vigilant tail these animals would succumb to parasites and that's another symbiotic relationship parasitism whereby ticks fleas flies bite or suck blood or lay eggs at the detriment of the host they don't necessarily kill the host but it is a symbiotic relationship ecologically nonetheless easy D I'm glad that you're enjoying learning about all of this stuff um, when you look around you go outside just have a look everything has got some purpose everything is connected nothing is here on its own without some connection to something else even the smelliest distasteful grass you might find has a purpose it gets left alone and therefore holds the soil together so anything you come across from the smallest insect to the largest animal they all have a purpose as annoying as some of them might seem they fit into the ecological role that nature's provided for them otherwise they wouldn't exist in natural systems of course we see beautiful balance in all of this when we go into man-made areas or cities where things have been changed well there's not a balance anymore and that's why things are very very different but out in nature there is always a balance there's always a way that things keep themselves in order always closer to water Still here, having a gentle look around. Our fin foot came out briefly. But that is about it. I'm hoping that the wind has died down at the top as well. So I'm going to try my luck back up there. About 10 or 15 minutes. And I really hope that we will be able to see those jackals that I saw last night. There were so many of them howling away, but there was so little light at that time. Hi Zoe, that is a question I would like to know the answer to as well. Zoe wants to know why aren't there lots of birds at the Karika River? There are Zoe. Um, in fact, yesterday I saw quite a few, but right now they are not. I have a few theories. One is the weather. It's overcast, it's humid, so it's a low pressure system, which means that at least the bigger birds are not going to be wanting to fly too much. It'll take a lot of energy. So maybe they're perched amongst these trees and I'm unable to see them. And also the wind. There may be smaller birds that are just kind of hiding in the dense thicket. But I saw a giant kingfisher, pied kingfisher, uh, the Nisner Turaco came by as well yesterday. So Zoe, they are about, it's just about um, being at the right place at the right time, I suppose. Like everything in the bush, like every sighting. Sometimes it's just about being at the right place at the right time.
our female is off she is behaving very differently to the males and that is because it's the time of year where the waterbuck are breeding and so she has probably and I think Lisa confirmed it for me yesterday got a little baby secreted away somewhere in the thickets just off up the hill there where she keeps going to and she spends her time away from them the youngsters that's what waterbuck do they hide them in thickets they go off and feed and pretend they don't exist and then come back and feed them for short periods of time until they're big enough to follow her around it's a it's a very good predator avoidance strategy Ooh, there we go food in food out so the nutrient recycling element as well that takes place ecology is all about cycles everybody all about cycles so the soil has got the nutrients the roots of the grasses bring up the nutrients that get diluted in the solution of the rain the photosynthesis in the leaves and the wind blowing over the leaves brings or sucks the water up through transpiration and then the photosynthesis those nutrients are converted into food and then the water buck feed on that food and after a set number of hours of rumination and digestion that partly decomposed food is recycled back onto the floor where the dung itself will then form the food for a number of smaller insects and organisms that will recycle that poo back into the ground okay so everybody um, James Henry will be going live on Sunday the 26th of February at 8 p.m. Central African time for a rehearsal of our live look back show which is currently in the development phase this show will have one of our naturalists talking over some of our great sightings and Wild Earth wants to know what you think so it's a live and interactive explorers only rehearsal so do send through your questions and comments when you do watch the show will have one of the naturalists talking over some of the great sightings and it will be interactive explorers only and your questions of course are most welcome so that is the live look back rehearsal another water buck just watching where that female's going. She's gone and hidden. Very impressive. Rochelle, I'll see if I can find you a crocodile. We didn't see one when you came across the, the wall just now. We'll see if we can find out where he is. It'll take us some time to find him, I'm sure. Maybe we'll send Darby in first. Sure. Sure. There we go. The reason why a water buck needs to drink so much water and why a lot of the other ruminants also need to drink a lot of water is to add to the saliva that they need for breaking down food. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Picking up those long green leaf parts of the grass. Now they're looking, there's a male just off to the left of us, just had a little run. These are not two fully grown males like the one we saw before. They're little heart shaped noses. Oh, 
large nostrils for breathing in not only the necessary oxygen but for picking up on the smell trying to figure out what are we okay I can hear you I can see you and now I'm breathing you in as well not danger Okay, well, we're going to scratch around this watering hole, see if we can find the crocodile. Let's send you over to Trish, who's doing a spot of birding. Well, I'm really trying to, Steve. I really am. But uh, not many birds have come down. That's okay, I'm still having a great time. I thought, so this is going to be the last... Uh, segment that you spend with me here then I'm going to try my luck further up again and hope that there isn't any wind so I thought maybe you would appreciate a bit of a look around and hope that my camera skills will allow you to do that that's the road I came down and if we go a little further up here then we can see the candelabra euphorbias. Beautiful. Isn't it so cool that I could show this to you like live right now? I think that's pretty cool. And given that we are live, ooh, and let's go very quickly over to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Given that we are live and interactive, please make sure to send through your questions and your comments. If you're watching on our app or the website, then you can register to do that. Sorry, I'm just going to show you the clouds very quickly. <laughs> If you're watching on our app or our website, you can register to ask us questions, send us comments, etc. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Then we can give you updates. That is the first vehicle I have seen in days come through here. And of course, it comes through here when I want to show you around. just want to show you where Wilfred, the wildebeest, was hiding just next to that tree there in that in that little nook. That's where he poked out his head to stare at me. Hi Betty, I think it was Betty but I'll be corrected by our director Nadine in a moment if it's not. Betty, yes. Betty, you wanted to know if we get leopard orchids in Karika. Well, I definitely haven't seen them. And I'm not sure if we would get them here, but I can definitely find out, Betty. I have not seen any leopard orchids. It is very, very dense here. So perhaps that's why I'm not seeing them. I got very distracted there by Nadine who said to me, maybe the leopard orchids are hiding where the leopards are hiding. I don't think so. Thank goodness the leopard orchids are static. Anyway. Leopard or orchids could be anywhere, but the only time that I've really seen them, to be honest, is in a savanna environment, and that's not this type of environment. But I think I will check, Betty, if they are distributed around these parts. Hmm. 
That's a really interesting question. Ooh, look at that. Looks like our black-headed heron that flew past there. I wonder if you can hear this. The hum of the evening has started to set in. The cicadas. It's like the endless summer hum. Like white noise. Wild Earth family, we have some exciting news. We are developing a brand new show. Live Look Back is a chance for you to look back at some of our best sightings from the past with your favorite naturalist who is live and can interact with you in real time. We would love our explorers to join the first rehearsal on the 26th of February with James Hendry to give us your feedback. Live Look Back, allowing us to bring you live content, rain or shine. So what are they doing, I wonder? Southern yellow-billed hornbills in the road. See scratching around, having a bit of a show with each other. And deliberately rubbing their bodies in the earth there. Pick up a couple of stones. Stones can go into the gizzard, the muscular gizzard that helps to break down and crush the food. Birds don't have teeth, you see. So they will ingest a certain amount of stones in their life to help with the mechanical breakdown of what they eat. But what's happened here? Ooh, a bit of sword play. What's happened here is that these southern yellow-billed hornbills have probably been preparing themselves for the rain like we have, and they have been preening themselves and oiling themselves and preening themselves and now suddenly it's gotten a bit dry and there seems to be no rain at the moment and they've got so much oil on the body that to eradicate some of the oil they use sand it's actually breaking the sandy particles oh hello <laughs> actually breaking the sandy particles there to make it into finer grained material if you've ever been to the petrol station 
and you see around the petrol station there's always these buckets full of sand for any oil spill or petrol spill the best way to pick up fuel and oil oily products is in a sediment and sand works very very well <laughs> having a little bit of a dance and our turtle dove is photobombing at the back looking for some seeds not too concerned oh another one out of here we're busy you go look for your seeds over there Hornbills are quite aggressive birds. They do often dominate other smaller bird species. Oh, just like that. So the ability to walk on the ground is a huge advantage for many of our birds. And then the ability to jump and fly off like that when there's some danger or if they're just off for another jaunt is very, very beneficial. Okay, well the wind is picking up and it sounds like Lauren is also doing some more birding. We're actually watching the hippos on Chitwa. We've come down to this water body to see if anything is happening. I was hoping for some elephants, but sadly, it's rather quiet. But it's just so beautiful all the same. Chitwa still remains my favorite dam after all this time. And it is a little bit windy, but I'm hoping that over the wind, you can listen to the sound of the trickling water. in trouble. I love the sounds too and it's important. It's important as a naturalist, any naturalist actually, but also a naturalist for wild earth to make sure that you guys also get to hear the sounds. Oh, see the sights, yes, but also hear and feel like you're really with us on the safari vehicle. So it's important to let you guys listen. It is windy today. Shaggy dog. Hello, shaggy dog. Yeah, you're saying yay, yeah, hippos. Absolutely. You know, when I went to Medikwe, which is such a fantastic reserve, it is mind blowing. They don't have hippos inside the reserve. They do have them in the river that runs alongside the reserve on the eastern side, coming from the north to the east, but they don't have them inside and in all the dams there. And when you start traveling around, you realize that you really miss them. They're animals that you sort of overlook here occasionally because you see them all the time and you hear them all the time. But when you go somewhere and they're not there, you think, oh, where are the hippos? So I'm just grateful to see them again. They're such magnificent beasts, really. And there are lots of hippos in this dam. It's difficult to see them now that the water levels are so high, but there are many hippos. Hi. Ah. 
But naturally, when water becomes so readily available, the pressure on one water body lessens. The carrying capacity actually increases, and therefore, hippos can move. Not only can the body of water hold more hippos, but hippos can move. So if there was just a little bit too much pressure on this dam with the number of hippos, they can, of course, move to another dam. Or even, it doesn't have to be a dam. It can sort of just be a pan that has opened up, like that one that I showed you earlier at the very start of drive. It's doubtful that you'll see a hippo there, but if it was feeling too much pressure here, then it absolutely can go there. But once the water volume reduces, and especially in times of drought, that's problematic. That's when you're going to see lots of detrimental effects to the hippos. Is that an ox pecker on your head, Mr. Hippo? <laughs> Jackie! Wow! Okay, hippos are your favorite and your dog is called Hippo. <laughs> Jackie, I need to know what kind of dog you have. I need to know. I won't be able to sleep tonight. Is it a big dog or have you gone and chosen and the name hippo for a tiny little handbag dog please tell us I love dogs I'm such a dog person I love cats too I'm just allergic I had beagles many beagles such great dogs but my goodness they're stubborn that's a brave ox picker It's down, you're going to get your bottom wet. What are these hippos doing? Okay, there are more hippos over the other side. Echo, you are asking about these bird nests, which is in the big dead tree. Do you know, Echo, you're only six years old and that is a great question that you've asked me. Why are they above the water? Echo, I want to tell you two things. In winter, where that tree is, is actually an island. It's not entirely submerged in water. And we call it the sort of floating island because the water levels get so low. But Echo, the reason they are above the water is one, it's a great tree, and two, it actually... Sorry, these hippos are up to no good at the other side. It actually keeps the birds and the eggs inside relatively safe from some predators. Because if you think about it, all the land-based predators that may want to jump up and eat eggs won't because they have to swim across the water for it and it's far too dangerous here. So it keeps them safe. It doesn't keep them safe from aerial predators like other birds, maybe raptors that want to come down and eat the eggs. But generally, they're quite safe up there. And the nests belong to the buffalo weavers. So if you were watching earlier on, I showed you village weavers. But this nest in particular, the big messy ones that are really, really large in size, they actually belong to the buffalo weavers. So same family, but different birds. They're black and they have a big red beak. I'll try and see if I can see one for you. And the nests look really messy, but they're actually quite organized up there because they sort of are colonial breeders. And what that means, Echo, is that they all breed together and they all stay in those nests. Ah, hippos are just appearing out of nowhere.
Jackie, darling, you're saying it was a big dog. It was a... I missed that. The wind is pumping, shall we say. A Westie. <laughs> oh, Jackie, darling, you called a Westie a hippo. <laughs> Well, that is such a fantastic name. I love Westies. <laughs> I wish I'd been a little bit more creative with my dogs. They were Poppy and Pepper. But I should have gone for something way more creative. I love that, Jackie. Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> I believe some of you also have named your pets after the leopards and different animals that we actually see out here. Please do share it if you have. I have a teddy bear called Ribbon, but it's not really the same thing. Okay, Echo, I've spotted one of the birds for you. If all of you can go to the top left of the tree and you're gonna see a red-billed buffalo weaver. There we go. Not a very exciting bird to be honest to look at, but they do have a striking red beak. And it's those birds that create these big mass nests, nice and safe above the water. And inside there will be chambers, tunnels, little spaces for females to lay eggs. It's not just a big cluster of sticks is what it looks like to us, but actually there'll be little safe areas inside for all the females. They're very noisy birds as well, just like the village weavers that we saw earlier. And you know, they continually add to their nests. And Echo, I'm going to tell you something that's very cool. The number of sticks that a male adds to the nest is related to the number of females that he has. So the males want to have as many females as they can. And he will add that number to the nest. I've still got a lot of animals to find. <laughs> Hyenas, wild dogs, jackals, triagama. Dwarf monkeys, oh, feeling the pressure. Zach, you're saying your pit bull is called Gator <laughs> because he pops his jaw like a gator. Wow, well, there you go. We've got a hippo and we've got a gator. I love pit bulls. My brother has a staffy, a blue staffy. These dogs have such terrible, undeserved reputations. Gator the pit bull. <laughs> Oh, you people are creative. I'm sure someone has a dog called Tingana. I'm sure, I'm sure I remember that. <laughs> Linda Polly, I know this. Linda, I actually know this. Why did I forget about Linda's hamster? Everyone in Wild Earth actually knew this. Linda's hamster was called James Hendry. <laughs> Sadly, is no longer alive, but yes, James Hendry, Linda. What are your other hamsters called, Linda? You must tell us. <laughs> I remember that. 
Linda wrote a song for us and we all used to sing it around the dinner table. Wild Earth loves the animals. Wild Earth loves the earth. You can see why I did not have a career in singing, but that was Linda's song and we used to love it very much. Thank you, Linda, for being here. Why did I forget there was a hamster called James Andrew? Oh. Okay, I think the theme today is really water bodies, so we're going to send you to Steve at one. Hmm, thanks Lauren. Well, look what we found. We found some tracks heading towards this pan system and I was quite keen to talk about this pan system here on this road in the middle of Juma called Pangolin Track. It's got a lovely number of, of wetland spots and when it comes to little muddy wallows like this they are instrumental in the livelihood of ranos and they actually form part of territorial males territories as if he has a number of these muddy wallows he will attract females like this one to come through for the health spa benefits that the mud provides. Now the mud itself is accumulated at the bottom of the landscape as we discussed before and that gives rise to these wallows that will actually stay in place, the mud themselves and the water, for some time depending on the rainy season and will service a number of animals such as warthog, buffalo, rhino and elephant. Those are the large ones that we talk about. Then we don't think about the wasps and the birds that use the mud for their nests and for their tombs. The substance that was here a long time ago is so beneficial and the rhino obviously uses it for cooling for cooling and for also suffocating any ticks that might be on the body. Wendy, yes, monocular ears enables the rhino to hear in multiple directions at the same time to pick up on the smallest of sounds. There's a very useful trick. The eyesight, most people will say, is not great. They're very good at picking up movement, everybody. But if you look at the size of the eye, it is quite small. Compare that to the nostrils. They are enormous. And the very mobile, large ears are able to pick up on many, many sounds around. And their nose obviously pick up on things as well. But not much bothers a rhino. They need to be able to see where they're walking. And then they need to be able to see what other rhinos are around. Other than that, most things really leave them alone. Obviously the, the natural state of a rhino's horn when it has not been removed due to anti-poaching purposes is long and sharp and it is designed very similar to that of our fingernail. It's just made up of keratin. There's a bit of melanin in there that helps to strengthen it and the rhino uses it for defending themselves or their calves against predators and the males use it for fighting and competing for females similar to the spur fowl and similar to the water buck. Obviously though rhinos when they compete it's a little bit more of a heavyweight match. And then now this female Bless her heart, was injured in a fire, we believe. You can see she's a little bit burnt. She doesn't seem too unhealthy. Her body looks good, her skin looks good. She's just still healing. With elements there on her undercarriage and around her anus. But her body looks in mighty fine condition. And the 
nostrils low down to the ground, very good at picking up on smells. And that large mouth, we spoke about the water buck's mouth. Well, the rhino just hoovers in the grass. They are a massive lawn mower. And they move through and they feed on half a foot of grass wide as they walk. And this mega herbivore and its role in the landscape has not been well documented until recently. And Picky, you know this female, she is a gorgeous lady, isn't she? Pity about her injuries, but I'm sure she'll heal nicely from them. So the mega herbivores such as rhinos and hippos, they mow the lawn. They don't have any potential of overgrazing. They can't. They just use their lips to feed on the grass. And so what they do is they facilitate and they open up grassland systems. Earlier in the beginning of the show, someone asked me, Steve, what are you going to do about the long grass? And I said, well, the rhinos and the buffalo are going to help us deal with that. And that's what they do. Rhino have no ability to select with a large mouth like that, so they just hoover everything in. Because they're a large animal, their nutrient requirement is not very high. They can take bulk and be satisfied. Because they are quite large, they cool down slowly and they heat up slowly as well so it doesn't require a lot of energy to do that but the metabolic energy helps and sitting in some mud wallows helps as well a contrast to that of a small steenbok that's got a very small body they need much higher energy requirements they can't afford any roughage any bulk they have to feed on the best quality vegetation they can find and their mouth parts are designed to allow them to do so. So we are quite a few vehicles um, still moving around in this area where <clears throat> the lions were last seen and they were last seen kind of like heading into the direction where we are. So, I thought, you know, there's Impala here. If we wait here for a long time, maybe they'll emerge from out of the woods. But um, for now, we're just going to watch this Impala. Look at that beautiful light on the Impala. And getting closer and closer to sunset. And it would be great if we can find those lines again before the sun is down we can head a little bit further south after this just now and try and find those lines again but for now these impalas look very calm very content No sign that they are in fact worried about any predator at the moment. too calm these impala doesn't mean the lions are not here but i think we should move a bit south and maybe we can encounter them again maybe wait here another 10 minutes and then we'll move After hours and hours and hours of searching, finally, we found the cheetahs. 
It was quite a struggle, let me tell you. I think we covered almost every road here, and of course, Murphy's Law, the one road that we don't do, and in fact, we almost did, but turned off. We've changed our minds as we were crossing over onto this road. Lo and behold, there are the cheaters. It always works out that way, doesn't it? It's only two and a half hours later. Oh, look, they're up, yay. <laughs> and down. So we're looking at them from quite a far distance away. We're at least 150 meters away. So it is pretty far and the wind is quite strong. So <clears throat> I'm hoping that it doesn't mess with us too much because it is moving the vehicle. But for now, this is the best view of them we're going to get. And if they don't move, we can try and go around to the other side. There's another road that's maybe going to cut 100 meters off. So we might get to about 50 meters from them. But it is really good to catch up with the three amigos. These are the three young male cheetahs. <clears throat> and we can't see if they've eaten or not, unfortunately. Freddy, yes, absolutely they can. So very bushy areas are not uncommon for cheetahs. They need the bushy areas to be able to stalk close enough to prey. They do like more open areas for building up speed, but they're more than capable of hunting even in thick areas because then you don't need to build up speed, if that makes sense. So in an open area, <clears throat> even if prey spots you, if you can build up that speed, you'll quite quickly outrun them and catch them. In a thick area, you don't need to because you can get a lot closer and surprise them at close range, just like leopards and lions would. So they are more than capable of surviving in thick areas. The issue comes in where in thick areas they might encounter spotted hyenas, leopards and lions more and because of that close close range surprise that happens that they can do to prey that can also happen to them and they can get themselves into sticky situations with leopards, lions and spotted hyenas. So they need to be careful in those thicker areas of running into other predators but they can definitely survive in them. A lot of the cheetahs that I've seen are not in open areas like this they actually prefer to be in slightly more um, <clears throat> shrubbed woodland areas. So a lot of the time I've seen cheetahs in very thick palm forests. And the palms are about the same height as me. So all of these palm fronds are sticking out with spikes everywhere. And there's cheetahs running in between, hunting things more than, more than capably. So they really do survive in a variety of habitats they just prefer more open areas for safety reasons and so they can build up speed to outrun herbivores but in amakala for example it's a mix of grassland tropical forest or subtropical forest namakaru dune forest so there's actually a lot of thickets in amakala and in some places you can't see more than a meter or two off the road it's so thick and yet we still find cheetahs in those areas so these boys have moved so far They've gone right the way through to those subtropical thickets. They've gone into the Nama Karu. They've gone to the dune forest. So <clears throat> they are more than capable of surviving almost anywhere. Okay, so we're going to stay with the cheetahs, but apparently I'm sending you over to Tess, whoever the other Tess is. I'm quite shocked, but apparently the other Tess has some buffaloes. So that sounds cool. I have made it to the top and thank goodness there isn't a lot of wind and we have some buffalo. I think that's a win. This is a really nice herd and I'm very glad that I'm able to spend some time with some larger animals. Down at the Karika River it was really nice but uh, being able to spend time with some larger animals that are moving around is also fantastic. Anyway, if you have just joined us, welcome. This is a buffalo herd in Karika with Mitrajala and across our other locations. We've had a lot going on too. Steve's been talking about ecology. Lauren's been excited to see a hippo. She didn't get to see very many of them in Medique, so she's really excited. And the only cat so far belong to Chris in Pridelands. So really nicely paced 
sunset safari I would say. As for me, like I explained, I've only just made it back to the top where there is thankfully very little wind and I was down in the valley at the Karika River before that to try and hide from the wind. Unfortunately, no animals joined me, which is what I was hoping for. There's lots of little calves in this herd, little fluff balls. There's also quite a bit going on, which is nice. So this is, uh, I've seen this herd quite a few times since I've been here. They like this spot a lot. There's an ostrich in the background as well. So there's been some play fighting. There's been a bit of serious fighting. Even some attempts at mating. These two youngsters, one that's on the ground and the one that's pointing its butt at us. They look like they are play fighting a little bit. So, so important for the development, both physical and neurological and social for mammals. A lot of them are caked in mud. And it makes sense because over the last few days, as you would have known, when I just got to Karika, there was so much rain, so much rain. And so every little depression in the ground got filled with water and then mud once it started to dry up a little bit. And the buffalo were having the best time. These two are just too cute. Hi Owen, you'd like to know if buffalo herds stay together their whole lives? So the core of the herd is made up of females and their offspring. And for a lot of antelope it's, this, it's that way, where the core is made up of females and their offspring. And with the males they have their own dominance hierarchy and those males, so uh, male calves, will have to go off and form bachelor groups. Now those bachelor groups kind of hang out on the fringes of herds. They don't necessarily have to move off and find a completely different herd of their own. But the problem is, <laughs> look at this one going a little bit crazy. I think it might uh, be bothered by some flies. It's very funny if you can't see the flies though. But like I was saying, the males will form their own dominance hierarchy that's a little bit more um, a little bit more in flux than those of than that of females because remember the females and their calves are the core of the herd. And then those bachelor groups they can sometimes follow around the herd or they might follow around a different herd but they don't necessarily have to disperse and find their own territories in the way that that we see with many other antelope. Remember, buffalo herds get huge, huge, huge. And they wouldn't be able to get that large if they weren't sticking together. But that doesn't mean they have to stick together their whole lives. But again, the females and their calves make up the core of the herd. Whereas the, the males, it's a little bit different. Remember the older males, they get left behind. Those are the Dugger boys. But herds get huge. Anyway, over to Chris to have a look at one of the animals that these buffalo really wouldn't like to get too close to. Well done on that buffalo, Trish. We have managed to find these lions again, and fortunately, smack in the middle of the road. Now, I can only see four at the moment, and I have no clue who they are. I can't see enough of them. The one lioness that I did see earlier, as we arrived in the sighting, 
does remind me of one of the big lionesses of the Ngati pride. It's got that kind of like a droopy ear. And so my opinion here is that it would be members of the Ngati pride. But it could very well be breakaways. We, we are not 100% certain. One thing that I am certain about is that they had a meal. Look at those bellies. Not overly full, but there's definitely some content in their stomachs in terms of animal material. But I'm delighted that they are around and we could actually manage to see them. Even though they are sleeping. I'll take sleeping lions any time above no lions. Just an update on that carcass, that kudu calf that the pixie pan female is feeding on. Uh, we've had a number of guides going to that particular location. Hello. <laughs> and so far, no joy. And we'll just keep tabs on our communications with the other guides. Uh, we are in the far south of the Conservancy, and that sighting is in the far northwest, so it is relatively far from where we are. So we're going to stick it out with the lions for now. And then if we do receive a report that there is in fact a leopard feeding, we will definitely head there, but that will only be if the leopard is there. Anyway, we're going to stick around here. We'll be back with the lions soon. Let's head over to Lauren, see what she's up to. We found them. Again, not quite a pool party, but I found a herd of Ellie's. Probably relishing the fact that it's cooled down and it really has, thank goodness. And look at this over here, Olof. We're going to have to do some maintenance after this sighting and of course after the Ellie's leave. Luckily, it's not a huge tree and doesn't require much muscle, but we will have to move that out of the way. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie's. I think if I just move a little bit forward, we're gonna get some nice views of the youngsters. Wendy's in a good mood. Hello, my girl. You just want to have a look at your youngsters. You know, when female elephants do that, she's just, she knows you're there. She knows what you are. She has an understanding of the vehicles place out here. They see vehicles day in, day out and have done for many years. That's just to say, hey, 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 you just know your place. This is my herd. These are my babies. You just stay put there. <laughs> oh, baby Ellie's are so cute. But another thing that is cute is spots. Well, everybody, we had Mawati for a moment. We've uh, also got a must elephant bull here. And Mawati, we stopped for the elephant bull. He's a magnificent fellow just over here. I don't know if you're going to get him now. He's moving on the side of the turmoil mound. But then I stopped. I heard Impala's alarm calling. I looked down the road and I saw Mawati looking at me. He uh, 
then moved just off the road. I think it was the elephant that was concerning him. He was going to walk around the elephant. He didn't want to interact with an elephant bull and must. And we're just trying to see where he's coming out. It's a tricky little spot here. Let me just move forward to get another view of this elephant and maybe we get another angle for our leopard. Oh, our elephant is moving behind the tumor mound. He's got enormous tusks. I think I'm going to turn around here, Darby. I'm just going to scan. Mawati is, um, it's that time of day where he'll be okay with us. He will be okay with us now. In the daytime, he's not generally as relaxed. So my feeling is he'll just walk around us like that and just pop back onto the road there. You said you saw him walking with some pace, eh, Darby? Our elephant is not very relaxed because he's in full must. And uh, enormous tusks are he's going to be in the road again. So it's going to be elephant and Mawati into action. Don't think Mawati's going to try and mess with this fellow though. He's a very impressive bull. Shot of those tusks. Hmm, dark my lover, don't worry, he is very vigilant. When he went into the Marib sites the other day, he took ages to get in. He's a very considerate male. Very aware of the dangers lurking. But this elephant bull in must requires lots of water. He, um, he was feeding on the termite mound where the nutrients are a little bit higher. We know termites recycle nutrients and turn it back into the soil. And so anything growing out of a termite mound will normally have a higher quality than that growing around. So you don't find elephants in full must eating as much as they do when they're not in must. But he's now going to be moving, seeing if he can find some elephants to catch up with. But we're going to carry on scratching around. We're not going to give this elephant bull any more time, just because he's not 100% relaxed. And there's an elephant, I mean a, a leopard to be seen. Hopefully. Do you on where did you see him, Darby? Like Okay. Hmm. We might be lucky. We might be lucky. He might have slowed down. Camouflage of a leopard is just otherworldly. The state of our planet is now critical. 
Children are the future conservationists and it is more important than ever that we reach them. By encouraging them to understand nature, love it and interact with it, we hope that they will want to preserve it. At Wild Earth, we are now able to bring back our Wild Earth Schools program thanks to our explorers. Thanks to you guys for helping to reach kids from all over the globe and teach them about nature. Wild Earth Explorers, making a difference. Animals are out. so much less. In the background, there, there's some milk that because I've been seeing in the process. So we are still with the cheetahs and we've just had a quick catch up with the ecology team and it seems like they saw them moving a little earlier and managed to snap some photos. And it looks like they have had a meal, but maybe about two days ago. So they're not full full, but they're not empty either. So this is great news for the boys. They seem to be doing really well. I mean, they're quite ambitious. We've seen them chasing everything they shouldn't really be chasing, but <laughs> at least they're successful with something. I doubt it was something as big as all the animals we've seen them chase recently. But you never know. They're getting to that point now where they might actually start being successful with some pretty big animals. Things like red heart to beast adults or black wool to beast adults. They've already taken down a big kudu, so they're definitely capable. As long as all of the contributing factors are aligning. And maybe we'll be lucky just now and see them getting up to show all of us as well. That would be awesome. Right, I have got my radio volume up, so you might hear some other people chatting. We are in charge of this sighting, so if anyone wants to come back and have a look, then they can. But just as a quick reminder for everyone, James Hendry is going to be going live on Sunday, the 26th of February at 8 p.m. Central African time for a rehearsal of our live look-back show. 
which is currently in our development phase. So it's a show that has one of our naturalists talking over some of our great sightings and we want to know what you think about it. It's a live and interactive explorers only rehearsal. So make sure to join and to send through your questions and comments for that to give us that very important feedback. We would absolutely love to hear from you and to have you join. So please do if you can. 26th of Feb, 8 p.m. Central African time. They look like they're quite cuddly. They've chosen the one only tiny little bush in the whole area to lie down fairly close to. But at least I suppose, even with their colors, the way they're lying, you can see the white of the, the belly of one and the black tip of the ear of another. So we at least know they're there. Shaggy dog, I really hope so as well. But for them, I mean, the fact that they're eating as is, is amazing. You know, it is important, especially for young cheetahs, to have that practicing phase, which starts when they're cubs. Every time they play, they're learning and they're practicing their skills. So even if they are chasing things that are a bit above their pay grade, um, it's actually good for them. It's, it's great experience. We just hope that they don't get injured in the process. So for now, it's, it's a good thing that they're practicing on, on quite ambitious animals or practicing ambitious kills, I should say, or hunts. But they are definitely doing enough to get food because they have been eating. We don't know what they've been eating because we haven't seen them on a carcass in a while, but they have been eating, which is good. It means they are successful. They are doing exactly what cheetahs should be doing. And as a coalition of three young males, I mean, if any young males are anything to go by, that young adult phase is for making mistakes and for trying and for, in all honesty, just having a great time and developing those bonds. So they are doing exactly what young male cheetahs should be doing. It's purely the human aspect of us worrying about them that makes it seem a bit more risque. Purely because we sit on the sidelines and go, oh my goodness, what are you doing? You're going to get yourselves hurt. Like moms do. You know, that's exactly what we're doing. We care about them and we, we grow and we kind of grow an attachment to them. Because who wouldn't? They're incredibly beautiful boys. We've been able to witness them here for months consistently and you don't get that often with cheetahs. So... We worry about them, and I think that's a natural thing to do. It shows that we care. But we do still have to remember that it is actually natural cheetah behavior to do that, even if it is stressful for us to watch. But they're clearly doing fine, because if they are eating, they're, they're managing to kill things just fine. Maybe it's just a lot of small meals, which would make sense for cheetahs. A lot of small meal scrub hares and dikers and things like that, baby animals that they could finish pretty quickly. And so we wouldn't find them on a kill. We'll just find them with... Half full bellies. But I would love to see them in action again. Morgan and I got really, really lucky a while ago when we saw them hunting or well, chasing a scrub hare and chasing warthogs in the same day. Didn't manage to get any of them, but did get a proper hiding from the warthogs. And about two days before, we saw them chasing zebras, including an adult stallion. One nearly got kicked. It was very stressful for us. But for the cheetahs, great practice and a, and a learning curve. How else will they know not to follow and chase adult zebras if they don't nearly get themselves kicked and beaten? It's the only way to test your natural instincts and, and learn your boundaries, really, when you're an, a predator. But we've been very lucky with them in the last three weeks. Very, very lucky indeed. I see some movement. They're alive. I think they're loving this cool weather. <laughs> Thank you, Nadine in Johannesburg. Yes, they, they slightly moved. That's, that's all we might see for now. But I think they are enjoying the weather at least. And so are we. It's nice and cool. So many animals out and about here in this open area. Eland, Fildebeus, Blessbok, Ostrich, Impalas, and of course our 
sculpture just on my left. I'm now showing you the right. There was a very, very happy zebra fall. I'll try and find it for you. It was jumping about, super excited. Gosh, I'm just um, getting all the cars today, huh? There we go. There it is. So you can see it's slightly brownie. Oh, hi, Inga. You say that Karika is the hub of all zebras. I think I've got a comment similar to this before as well. There really are a lot of I was about to say very happy zebras and they are very happy lots of zebras and many happy ones so if you look at the fall on the right there with its mother it's not using black and white the one on the left though that's a little bit smaller still kind of dirty brown as if it's been rolling in the sand but parts of it around its neck are starting to become white the distinct black and white that we're used to and that's probably because when they're born they have these downy hairs that are a little bit fluffy from afar they don't really look fluffy but if you go up close you can see that they are and that down hair has to fall out and stronger guard hairs have to form and it's those guard hairs that make the black and white contrasting pattern that we're so used to so it kind of looks like an in-between at the moment. You know, there's some movement at the moment. But one line is just grooming itself a little bit. I'm not very hopeful that they are going to move a lot. The fact that their bellies are somewhat full, I think they're going to probably sleep until well after dark. And that is so pretty, isn't it? And a nice big yawn. Just love the contrast with the safari sand is asking there, hi there, if Lagatha is part of this pride now. Well, she often joins with the Ngati pride. We often see her join her joining up with the pride and for a couple of days and then she just goes back to her solitary lifestyle again. So, I mean, there's clearly evidence that she still recognizes and understands that this is her original pride. But she never stays for long. She, most often a couple of days, and then she goes by herself again. An interesting case, this leg of her. I personally haven't seen her in quite some time, but there's been confirmed reports <laughs> that, that she is still around and she is well. So a confirmation there's five lions here, yeah? not four as I stated earlier. A 
I'm just delighted that we finally have some light. It's been quite some time since we actually had some light. There's a paw going into the air. And Nicole there is asking, are lions the most social of the big cats? Nicole, the quick answer is yes. They are the most social. In fact, they are the only true social cat. The only other cat that forms or exhibits some form of social behavior in terms of groups is male cheetahs who also forms coalitions like the three amigos but other than that all other cats are solitary by nature so lions are the true only true social cat so not only are they more social than other cats they are the only true social cat with the exception of cheetah males Cheetah females are also solitary. Right, I'm just going to monitor what's going to happen here. I think let's head over to Steve, who apparently has some spots. Well, hello there. We did some loops and some juggles and uh, came all the way around, anticipated getting in front of him and he ended up back on the road. He is not the most relaxed male there, but he's going to go in there. Into the thickets. Mawati, the dominant male leopard of this area. Excuse me now, we've, I've had good sightings with him, if you just sit quietly and try not to sneeze and make noises like that. We're between the hyena dens and Weaver's Nest Road that we found him on before. He was walking up this, this is sort of the main arterial road from the centre of Juma down to the south. And uh, I don't think he's going to do a big loop around us now. So we'll just sit quietly. And the Canova, it is so great to see the ghost frequently. I don't know how often he's been seen lately. doesn't get seen a lot because well his nature is well typical of a leopard really he was never habituated as a youngster as most of the Sabi Sands leopards tend to be so you would call him skittish but by his nature that is what leopards are they are ghosts there are some reserves that have many leopards you'll never see them just because they just don't want to be seen If a leopard doesn't want to be seen, as you can see, it will not be seen. But he's not skittish like he was when he first arrived on the property. If he heard the car, he would jump off the road. Now at least you can get a little bit closer. But this sort of time of day, as the sun is setting and it's starting to get a bit dark. Have you got it, Darby? No starts to get a little bit more relaxed with one vehicle most certainly
Australia. Very special to see him. I'm glad you were able to watch. Only a brief moment, but uh, three times longer than it was when we first found him. But I don't think it's over yet. I'm going to keep looking. Now, you see the camouflage of these cats and this vegetation this time of year. Thankfully, they choose to walk in the roads as Chris's lions, I'm sure they're on the move now. No doubt they're keeping to the nice open road as well. So these guys are moving and that and excuse the power lines, it's inevitable. We have power lines running through here, it is what it is. But right there by the next power line is the area that we often see those zebra, the wildebeest, and the impala zebra clearing. And if we look at the way they're moving, they, they are quiet, they move, stop, move, stop. So I'm not gonna say they're hunting, but I think they might just be considering it. So we'll just check what happens and we'll stay about 50 to 100 meters behind them so we don't draw attention to them. Stations, these lines are now mobile northwards along Marshall. Okay, let's slowly move forward. Check that one. I'll stop just now. I want to be close. If there's going to be any action that we we have, okay, let's just stop here. And you can clearly see now. Once we stop, we'll show you. There we go. That they have obviously spotted something in the distance. And their reaction now will confirm to me whether they are truly interested in hunting or not. And if we can look at the grass, it's bending over to the left, which means the wind is coming from the animals that they are looking at to them, which means, oh, no, that one is already diverting to the side. So maybe, just maybe, might have something unfolding here. I'm not hearing any alarm calls of any of the animals up ahead. Which means... Just look at how the lioness goes low. This is incredible. One's going down, two lionesses to the side. And Gary says a live hunt in Pridelands would be epic. Well, there's no need to go anywhere. We can we can watch this. The setup, I like the setup. There's enough grass for them to be low. We've seen one lioness already going to the right. And what what might happen? Station approaching uh, Marshall Axis Junction. Just be aware that these animals are stalking something. So maybe they will chase. Maybe they would chase something towards them. We don't know what's there. It's either Wildebeest, Zebra or Impala. Or all three of them. We don't know. I 
and seeing Paulus running in the distance. I'm just going to get a different angle here quickly. Yeah, just a reminder that there is obviously safari operations ongoing on Pridelands other than us. So it's inevitable that we are going to meet other safari vehicles along the line. Hello there, Easy B. Who's saying I love the um, silent teamwork? It's like a special operation team. Uh, Reynard, if I may ask if it's possible to put your lights off there. Um, thanks, man. I did see Impala run, but I'm not hearing any alarm calls. So, let's go a bit closer. Um, because then we can set up. Whether this is going to be successful, I don't know. A number of their attempts are not successful. Probably the majority of their attempts fail probably as close as 60 70 percent and I can see more lions there and I'm not sure what they are after see Reynard's doing the right thing there he switched off his vehicle let the lions move around him like they want to I'm staying behind them We'll probably pass Reynard just now. Slightness is looking that way. Let me just get here. Alright, so what do we have? I'm just gonna grab my binoculars. Where are they? Did I leave them in my tent? I think I did. I did see Zebra and Impala here earlier. But at the moment, I do not see any form of prey animals. I did see Impala move away. Very special stuff. This is awesome. What we'll do, we're going to pass Reynard. Goodness, it's raining. Predators suddenly all over. Well, I'm going to try and re-maneuver myself into a better position. Well, let's head over to Tessa, who's already got a predator with a kill. Oh, thanks, Chris. A predator with a kill on this side. That looks a little bit strange, let me tell you. So we've got a black-back jackal. There are a few others that are trying to come in and steal the kill from this one. And we were really confused at first. We thought that maybe that was a, a plastic bag or something. But actually, on closer inspection, it's a piece of skin that this jackal's chewing on. And we don't know where they got the skin from because they weren't here with it earlier and we came past to go to the cheetahs. So, I don't know if they maybe found this somewhere and maybe this is part of the kill that the cheetahs had that they didn't finish. And the jackals, now that it's cooled down and getting later in the day, they've woken up a bit early and are 
picking up bits and pieces because they are all over this area so I can only imagine this was leftovers from a meal especially only being a piece of skin and it looks quite fresh I don't think they've eaten the rest of the carcass that quickly I definitely think this was a find so I'm wondering if those cheetahs weren't in these thickets somewhere eating something and we just didn't notice them here the last two days but that jackal is having an absolute feast. It's trying its best to get those, those molars, which are so sharp, to go straight through that skin so it can bite off little pieces and get some nutrition. Beautiful example of carnassial shear, but jackals are also really smart, so they hold it down with their feet. You can see that standing on it. Pulling it up with the tip of the mouth, where the incisors and the canines are, and then slipping the mouth sideways to chew off chunks or shear off chunks with their really sharp molars towards the back of the mouth and the side. Like that. Now this is a perfect example of what all the predators will do to shear off some meat. You can see it's also shaking it around quite a bit so trying to reposition it while it's feeding just to get a slightly better angle and maybe better grip to shear through that skin. Also the force of shaking it like that hopefully will tear a piece off while it's busy chewing. But there are two other jackals waiting here. One doesn't seem very interested, the other one definitely does. It keeps looking over longingly wanting to steal some of it. Or at least share some. Oh, it's coming in. It looks quite a bit smaller and it's definitely lighter. I wonder if this is maybe a pup from a previous litter that stuck around. Looking for some scraps. They wouldn't necessarily just follow the cheetahs around. It is a good strategy, like the hyenas do for wild dogs. Jackals sometimes follow other predators, but they wouldn't necessarily just follow the cheetahs around because they'd get chased away quite regularly. Cheetahs don't tolerate scavengers close by. They'd rather either move off at speed or, or chase them. <laughs> okay, so there's one without a tail here that we've seen regularly in this area, so they definitely live here. And uh, even though it doesn't have a tail, it's absolutely beautiful. A wren, I agree, they are absolutely stunning. Such pretty colors, that mix of red and an ashy gray with that very dark black streak. Very, very pretty little animals. Very fox-like. Now, I don't know what happened to this one's tail. It doesn't look like it's anything fresh, so it probably had had some form of mishap when it was a little pup and lost the tail to maybe another predator or something like that. You never know. Maybe it was also possible, but it certainly hasn't disadvantaged it. For now, we'll send you back over to Steve with the ghost of Juma while we wait with the jackals. Well, we found him again. He's scent marking, scratching, urinating, and he prefers to be followed than to be in front of him. So he hasn't changed his course much. I think what he did is he just hid in the bushes until we moved away, and then he came back onto the road. But now he can smell something. We are in the infrared now, giving him lots of space. Wonder what he's picked up on there. Let's move up a bit, maybe we'll be able to see. We lose him very quickly in this undergrowth. 
Ahí nada. The male efforts are very good scavengers. Look at this grass. Otherworldly. MBD, a bit of luck, I suppose, but um, I've, I've tracked him many times before, and every time I lose him, I come back and he gets back on the road behind us. So that's all I was doing, was just trusting my gut. There he is, he's just on the left here, he's smelling something. It's getting quite thick over there. I don't know what he's smelling. That's not going to work. Maybe some lights, eh? We're on the top of the crest. Now the soil is very sandy, very well drained. Thank you, Wildeth, for this absolutely fantastic prize at Matea Safari Lodge at Madikwa in South Africa. I joined the Wild Earth Explorer program at its onset in 2019 and have absolutely loved every minute I have experienced in the bush with all the characters of Wild Earth, both human and hairy. Thank you again, Wild Earth. Sign up today and you could be the one experiencing it for yourself. So we made our way down the slope 
and we are with the Impala and this is what the lions were looking at so a couple of the lions went around to the right and a couple of them went around to the left we actually at the moment can't see any of the lions but they are definitely 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 stalking this herd of Impala so in that case what I will do is just remain with these Impala and this process can unfold in the next five minutes or in the next hour all depends on how long they take to get into a favorable position to do the final chase there's no easy way to predict it coming here now <laughs> and Jackie says I wish I had the patience of a large cat look they can be impatient sometimes they are sometimes impatient and do mistakes especially the young lions when they are involved in the hunt So they can show some impatience and so I'm not sure what will unfold here, whether these lions will succeed or not. Ah, just to remember that uh, with our user generated content we wild earth is always looking for unique jaw-dropping and incredible wild animal sightings from our viewers and we will use that across the wild earth platforms and in return you can actually monetize it you can earn money from that you can even win prizes and even be credited for your footage on our Wild Earth TV shows if those are used. So in order to find out more, go to the Wild Earth website and click on Content Creator to find out more on how you can get involved with this. Right, still seems like there's no direct action yet from these lions. Some of them went to the left and some went to the right. And like I said, this can take a while or it can happen in the next couple of minutes. We never know. The Impalas have not shown any sign that they've actually seen these lions yet. I heard a, a thick knee jumping up there now. Maybe it's one of the lines going closer. I don't know, it's one of those. And the only thing you can do is just stay here, you know. All right, we're gonna stay here for a bit. I mean, we, we, we have no choice. 
to stay here and see what unfolds here. Yeah. In the meantime, let's go over to Lauren to see what she's up to. We don't have anything for you, I'm afraid. Not cheetah, leopard or lion. But we are trying. It's been a very slow night for us. But I've just got the car in second gear, low range. My feet are here. I'm not even having to push the pedals. and just taking it easy. Listening to the night sounds, seeing if I can spot any sort of living being in amongst the vegetation. It's actually really relaxing. <laughs> Wendy's got a bit of a squeak, but other than that, you can hear things. You can hear the sounds of the night rather than the engine roaring. And just a final reminder for you all, both Steve and I will be doing our AMA, which stands for Ask Me Anything tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Central African time. Please do join us. I really am looking forward and slightly nervous to all of your questions. It is for explorers only, but please do get your questions ready. Ooh. You can ask Steve, you can ask myself. You can ask us both and we'll give an opinion each but get them ready. And this is your one chance to really ask anything. So you don't have to make it about the environment out here or the natural world. Really, it is ask me anything. I'll do one last loop around the open area. We got lucky last night with Miss Kalamba. Let's see if we can get lucky again tonight. We checked the northwestern corner for lions crossing through, but no such luck. I don't know where those Talamati breakaways went. They must have went north. I'm not sure I'm able to really answer that. Um, I know most of the guides, not them all, but most of them very well. I lived with Steve, Trishala, James, Tristan in the same camp, next door neighbors to one another for a very long time. So I do know them all extremely well. Obviously, I haven't worked together in the same camp with Cedric and Tessa for very long. I've never worked with Chris in the same camp, I mean. Mm. I really don't know. I don't know what I would ask them. <laughs> I'd have to think about that one, Francine. That's a tricky one. I think I know most of them better than maybe some of you. So I'm not sure I have to ask any questions to ask. But let me think about that. Let me think if I can come up with anything before the end of drive. I need to be careful. I know personal things as well. I know secrets. <laughs> okay, we're going to head to the open area and really see if we can find some animals for you all. So we wanted to show you the stormy weather blowing in that is making us flee for the north. We are also in infrared because the light has dropped so much with the storm clouds coming in. Now normally we have light until about quarter to eight. So we are 40 minutes early with infrared. And that's because the storm clouds are so thick that we are actually struggling to see. Now, it wasn't like this yesterday. Yesterday was a really hot day. This morning also, stormy and, 
and a bit misty and a little bit of rain and then all of a sudden it cleared up at lunchtime and we didn't think that we were going to have storm clouds rolling in and by this afternoon by the time we came out on sunset safari the clouds had started again but now we can really feel the weather has changed a lot it is freezing cold these clouds are everywhere and they are mean looking. I know you can't see the color and we can barely see the color anymore either, but they are navy blue clouds. So there is a lot of rain coming. We know it's already hit east of us, so it is coming our way. And uh, <laughs> we do not want to be caught in an absolute downpour of this scale because this is not the normal storm clouds we get. This is not the normal rain we get. This I'm sure is a, a spin-off of Cyclone Freddy that's headed towards the eastern coast of South Africa at the moment. So I know Steve was chatting about it earlier. I've chatted to quite a few friends up north in the Sabi Sands area in the Kruger Park area and they can see it coming. But uh, I think this is a bit of a spin-off because the way our clouds are moving, it's like the cyclone is sucking these clouds upwards. These are coming from the northeast and kind of spinning up towards the eastern side of South Africa as well. So I think the next few days are going to be a little cold and very wet, which is great for the animals, great for the, the, the vegetation. It's just going to be a bit challenging for us. But it will be amazing to see such a large scale storm coming through here to see how it actually handles because we haven't seen that before. So we're nervous but excited. Welcome back everyone. Well, we're standing by on the top of quarantine with imminent arrival we hope of Mawati. But uh, there's a hyena over there Dobby. Okay. We think we got very excited. We had uh, some eyes shine. Hyena's just over there. Had some eyes shine coming up the slope and we thought we had him. And then we zoomed in. Where's it gone? And then we zoomed in and it was a hyena. I think this is the second hyena altogether. Paula started alarm calling just now because of said hyena. But we didn't see him. He suddenly started moving across that way. So we're just standing by here. We have a feeling he got something off in the thickets there. We weren't able to relocate him. His general direction was to keep coming here. So we're standing by with our impala herd. The wind has suddenly picked up a little bit. Now comes our hyena in the road. Just out of view. Just out of view for the pole. Impalas are looking at it. And it would be wonderful, wouldn't it, to see Mawati make a hunt. Don't know if he's actually going to make it all the way up here, and uh, getting up here is just part of it. He's actually physically got to try and catch one of these animals who are very vigilant in the open. Not easily done. There we go, Darby should have the hyena entering frame in a moment. There we go. Who are you? Sorry about the pole. Oh, you're going to stop right there, are you? Oh, it can smell the leopard. Shader, we're going to call a pole dancer from now on.
Let us know who this is, everybody, if you can tell. Now, this is definitely, definitely a different one. This is definitely a different one from the one that came up the hill. The one that came up the hill was definitely a little wet. This one responded. Mm. Is this in Tima? I wonder. Green Gringarika. Thank you, Shaya. Thank you very much. You know how the impalas know in this pitch black light, sort of, that that's a hyena and not a leopard and they're not too concerned. It's crazy. They're just the body language, the shape of the ears, the slant of the back. They know. You are not a, you're not as dangerous to me as a leopard is. They walk through the herd of impala, they're all just staring. Maybe this is Hokumori's ticket. I need to distract the impala and then he comes up from the back. Sounds like quite a strategy. Vanilla, I haven't seen any sign of the Juma clan in Denning. I have absolutely no idea. Um, it's been very difficult to, to access quite a lot of the reserve. The den sites that we know of don't seem to be active at all. But after the amount of rain that we've had, they would probably have chosen different sites or moved. I don't really know. We will keep checking, of course. There are a number of places that they could possibly be at. I did hear someone coming on the property this morning coming to check the den sites. So it seems that they don't know where they are elsewhere. Which might mean that they are on the property. We will let you know, I can assure you. Okay, so from Impalas of Juma, very much the same as Impalas of Prylands. Let's see if Chris has an update to side. Okay, I've heard some Impalas alarming now. They've seen the lions, obviously. I don't know where the lions are. Cast a bit of light here. There's a lion there. <sighs> Obviously, the lions have tried something and spotted it. So now we can move. two meters from us. Okay, we might have to move here. No? Yes. Sorry, my friend, but you're about to push that onto the car. <laughs> you see how cross he was? So we didn't want to watch him push the thing over. That's why we moved. <laughs> This is what I'm talking about when I say just spend time with animals. 
This is very, very, very cool to see this. Do cheetah males groom each other for social bonding? And I can't give you a better answer than what they're actually doing in front of the camera right now. My chilled vibes on this vehicle is making me rather sleepy. But don't worry, I'm not sleeping yet. I will be soon, but not yet. I've been trying really hard for chameleons, but since my sort of first week here, I'm not really seeing them. At one point, I was seeing them everywhere. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, is that what I think it is? Oh my goodness, it is. Um, just show me what kind of view you've got from here, Olo. I think it's not going to be the best. Don't want to shine the light on for too long. So if you zoom in to where the shine and light is. There we go. You've got it just on the left there. It's going to be a tricky one. He's behind all the grass. But I found a chameleon. <laughs> a last minute chameleon after morning that I wasn't finding them. Hello, chameleon. We do see you. It's a small one as well. It's also not an adult. Flat necks are not huge in general, but it's not an adult. It's also not tiny. I just love watching them and I love the fact that they just cling on for dear life all night. This is them resting now, this is them sleeping, like what I will be doing in about two hours. <laughs> I like my sleep. And this is them. Waiting for daytime to wake up. Mike, I know. <laughs> I didn't really find anything else, unfortunately, but I found a chameleon and that's pretty impressive. Our drives are all about diversity. And you know, on nights like this, when it's really windy, they literally just cling on. A lot of the adults will sort of, if they're on a tree, in summer, when the tree's full with its leaves, they'll sort of move slowly back into the, the core, the inner part of the tree where the trunk is. But these young ones are just very sort of small and they just cling onto blades of grass. You are adorable. Look at your little hands and your little feet. Nathan, you are 10 years old and I do remember you, Nathan. You ask a lot of questions and you are asking, do all chameleons have curly tails? That is actually a very tricky question, Nathan, but I do think they do. I can't think of a species that doesn't. And that is because it's very much part of their lifestyle, Nathan. They use it to cling onto branches and to cling onto blades of grass. They can extend it so it looks straight, but then they can also curl it up. There are some wonderful species of chameleons in the world, my goodness, especially in Madagascar. Madagascar is sort of the heart of diversity, really biodiversity, and the chameleon species there are just incredible. You get little pygmy ones, Nathan, that are smaller than your pinky, and then you get big ones that like the panther species that will sit and probably take up your whole arm from your hand to your shoulder. Some really interesting looking chameleons, but I do believe they all have curly tails and they can use that for balance. Although you'll find them walking on the road occasionally, they spend their life in trees. And sometimes you do have to scoop them up and get them off the road. And it's not, I don't believe in touching nature at any point. But if it's a busy highway, like you find outside 
of this sort of sabi gan sabi sand gate near a town called Hoodsbride, and the cars are racing down, and you know that that little chameleon is going to take a long time to cross the road. Then you should give it assistance. But generally speaking, they spend their life in trees, so they're specially adapted with their hands and their tail to hold on to trees. But it's a struggle to find them during the day because they are so camouflage. You have to really know what you're looking for. Avril, to be honest, is very difficult for me to tell. Infrared is a wonderful tool, sort of what we're using to view the animal, but it's not with any natural source of light. So I'm also looking at the same sort of view that you have, and it's very tricky to tell, but... I don't want to shine any artificial light on it. They have really highly sensitive, pixelated eyes. Definitely smaller than my hand, for sure. Smaller than my palm, with all my fingers chopped off. I'm going to go for my palm, Avril. Does that help in any way? Probably not, because you don't know the size of my palm. So that's a very tricky question, but it's very small. I would say it would, it would fit into my entire hand and I would still have space left. Flap necks do get bigger than this. Amy, you just love their eyes. I know. And you know, their brain is... People sort of don't really associate intelligence with insects or reptiles or amphibians. But if you think about a chameleon's brain, it's seeing not only in... It's seeing two different pictures out of each eye. We can't do that. So it's, it can focus on one thing with its left eye and it can focus on a completely different thing with its right eye. So it can be looking at me right now being like, oh, goodness, wild earth. And then at the other eye, it can be looking at food. And the brain is actually able to process those two different images at remarkable speeds and understand what is going on around it. Humans can't do that. So when it comes to intelligence and cognitive ability, I think these all animals have some intelligence that we just can't tap into. I mean, we have binocular vision and our brain sort of processes very similar images from both our eyes. Yes, there's, a, there's an overlap, but it's very similar. But imagine two very different images from each eye. It's very impressive. So each eye can see 180 degrees. Straight on and then all the way back 180. And the brain is able to switch rapidly between each image. So say it spots a very delicious grasshopper with its left eye. It's not really going to need to focus on the right eye. So the brain can switch between the two rapidly and then it can focus on the one that it really wants. And that, of course, is the grasshopper. <laughs> I'm so glad I found my chameleon, but let's head back over to Steve and he see if he's had any luck with Mowati. No, no update. He hasn't come out of the block. Maybe he's waiting for us to go home before he uh, decides to venture out. Um, Pilers are still here on the right. We're very vigilant. Very hard for him to get through the thicket here, across an open road, and then into the open. Very, very difficult. And he hasn't come back up the road, so... Well, we had some good views of him at least. Probably the best sighting ahead of him. Darby, I was going through some old photos. Do you remember we had him with that warthog? Oh yeah. Where we stayed at a tree, he killed a warthog. And, uh, People had gone for days to see him and no one had seen him and then Dave and I decided to stay 
and uh, just at the right time of day we were basically sitting with the camera framed on this very hairy looking massive warthog dead of course in the tree and then we just heard the <laughs> as he arrived back and his claws took him up the tree and it's just that time of day when the light just shifts just enough that he becomes a lot more relaxed and we kind of saw that with him this evening we first found him on that transition when there was still a little bit too much light but I think that must bull elephant also played a little bit of a role but we followed, followed him okay just didn't think he was happy to try and walk past us well, it is what it is last minute leopard shall we shall we who are we going to find in the open areas of quarantine this evening? There's the hyena tracks. Those two hyenas are like ships in the night with each other. <laughs> Gene, it's unlikely, but I mean, it's just be quite a useful technique. Get the hyenas to come in chase the impalas towards him and he'll benefit but uh, you saw the impalas didn't really get affected by the hyena but they the one came running because it heard alarm calls because they alarmed at another hyena that walked off to this one and then this one ships in the night ran across because they do respond very quickly to alarm calls just like we do So the wind is picking up a little bit. There hasn't been too much in the way of storm this evening as we anticipated. As the reports are coming through now that that tropical cyclone Freddy is actually moving further north towards Zimbabwe. So it seems like it's going to miss us. But uh, I don't know if it's all... There's always that tail that comes behind the cyclone. We might not get hit, hit head on. But I've no doubt we're still going to experience some weather. What do you think, Darby? Some weather coming? I think so. Feels like it. Feels like it. Opa, Gary, it's been a pleasure to show you Mawati and Chris with uh, some lion's tests with some cheetah, of course. Splendid to be out and about. Feline Friday. Feline Friday, everybody. Well, we do thank you for joining us this afternoon on the Sunset Safari. It's been wonderful hosting you out, doing all things ecology from my side. Uh, we will be seeing you once again bright and early tomorrow morning where all things wild and wonderful will be happening. Who knows who will be knocking on our door tomorrow morning and what we'll be finding. But until then, everyone, have a wonderful evening. Good night from us and goodbye.